Hello, everybody. Welcome to a Friday edition of the Computer America Show. That's right. It's the end of the week. We made it. And uh, hopefully all of you had a wonderful week, have some big weekend plans. Uh, this is our little pre-show that we do here on Computer America. In the uh, first hour, we're going to be talking to Matter Inform, uh, the company's uh, CEO and founder, uh, Drew Cox. Matter Inform uh, is into 3D, uh, high-resolution 3D scanning and imaging uh, for all those 3D printers out there. Um, we're going to be talking uh, about their the bevel. This is a very cool device. One minute until showtime. And in the second hour, we're going to be talking to Geotab, uh, the Vice President of Global Sales and Marketing. Uh, Colin Sutherland is here with us. And uh, we're going to be talking about what Geotab is and, uh, and about telematics. And that's what they're into. So uh, it should be a very interesting show. Of course, we'll also have our social media winner of the week. So sit back, relax, enjoy two hours of Computer America coming at you right here. And here we go, 15 seconds. I can't believe it's Friday already. Your show will go live in five seconds. Four, three, two, one. Broadcasting live, it's America's longest running national radio talk show on computers, Computer America, hosted by national columnist Craig Crossman. Look for Craig's weekly column in your favorite newspaper. This show is being beamed nationwide at ComputerAmerica.com. Keep it here for technology news, computer products, guest interviews, and your phone calls. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. It's the nation's longest running nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers. Computer America is heard around the world and coast to coast. And I'm your host, Craig Crossman. And I'm your co-host, Ben. And it is Friday. Yes. Another week of broadcasting excellence in the filing cabinet. And uh, we... <laughs> Uh, it's going to be a great show. Uh, as always, of course, we're going to have our social media winner of the week. Yep, some lucky person is going to be winning that uh, beautiful Logitech MX Anywhere 2 wireless mouse valued at $80. Uh, and uh, we'll be announcing that name probably sometime in the second hour of the show. Hopefully you have your entries in. And if you don't, well, you see you missed out. But that's okay. You can always go back to ComputerAmerica.com and enter in our social media contest. Everything is there. Uh, <clears throat> in the uh, second hour of the show, we're going to be joined uh, by a company called Geotab. And uh, they're into something called telematics. And we're going to go uh, basically what that industry overview of telematics is. And that isn't kind of overly technical. And, uh, and talk about the services and what they can do. <coughs> it's actually a very interesting um, uh, company. Uh, we're so gonna too. I'm sorry? I think so, too. Yeah. Uh, Colin Sutherland is going to be joining us. Uh, he is the Vice President of Global Sales and Marketing in the second hour. And in the first hour, we're, uh, it's also going to be extremely fascinating, I believe. <coughs> we're going to be talking to a company called Matter Inform. And they're into high resolution 3D scanning. But you know, that's always been very expensive, especially in today's day and age of 3D printers coming into their own. It wouldn't be cool if you could just take an object and scan it in three dimensions. But they always, always cost thousands of dollars. Well, no longer. We're going to be talking something called the bevel. This is, a, which actually debuted at CES uh, this year. Uh, and uh, this is an amazing product. And we're going to be joining, joined by Mr. Drew Cox. He is the CEO and founder of the company, uh, talking about bevel and 3D scanning and 3D printing in general. It should be a very interesting hour. If you have a question for our guest, we'd love to hear from you. 347-884-8881. Uh, That's 347-884-8881. We'll get you on and get you through. Uh, if you don't want to go on the air, but you still have a question for us, go to any page at computeramerica.com. Any page on the upper right hand corner, it says submit a question. Just click it. It's a link. It'll take you to our question submission page. You can uh, 
then type in your question, hit the submit button, and Ben and I will see your comment or suggestion or response uh, immediately, and then we can act accordingly on it. Uh, the other thing is that we are a radio talk show, but we also provide live video streaming. You can actually watch the show. You can see me. You can see Ben. Uh, you Ben has the uh, technology to display websites, movies, videos, everything. So you can see everything as well as listen to the uh, pro program. It's always just it makes things a lot more interactive and a lot more fun. We've been doing it now for a long time. And uh, just head over to computeramerica.com, click the show lounge uh, selection in the pull down menu on any page. And uh, you'll be taken to our you know, live video stream. You will join the show already in progress if you're doing it live, which is Monday through Friday, 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, if you do it later on, you'll go to our archives uh, page where you can watch mo any, most and all of our shows, actually. We archive the videos. We archive the audios uh, of the shows at the Apple's iTunes, on Blog Talk Radio, on the TuneIn uh, Radio Network, on the uh, SoundCloud Stitcher. Uh, you can also listen to us live on the IRN Radio Network. So everything you need to know about what Computer America does is at the internet home of our radio broadcast, computeramerica.com. That's all you really need to know. Uh, we'll be talking uh, about the different websites. All the websites that we're talking about tonight, today are also at computeramerica.com. Everything you need is there. Uh, ben, before we uh, uh, get started, uh, anything else I might have left out that you want to let our guests know about? Oh, you covered a lot there. Uh, I think we're good to go. Okay, yeah. All right, well, then let's, uh, let's do it. Um, our first guest is from a company called Matter and Form. It was founded by designers and programmers who needed a high-resolution 3D scanner but couldn't afford one. So guess what? They made their own. Showed them. Uh, the first product, uh, the Matter and Form 3D scanner, began shipping back in fall of 2014 and has sold thousands of units worldwide. Well, today we're going to be talking about the bevel. This is the world's first attachment capable of capturing real 3D photographs on any smartphone or tablet. This is amazing. Uh, other 3D attachments create the illusion of 3D by enhancing the depth of an image, uh, but fail to capture a file that you can actually use. Uh, you can even use Bevel for 3D printing. That's why they're calling it genuine 3D photography. Now, here with us to explain more about all this exciting stuff is Drew Cox. He is the Matter Informs uh, CEO and founder. Drew, welcome into Computer America. How are you? Good. Thanks, Craig. Thanks for having me on the show. And hello, Ben. Yeah, thanks for joining us. So this is this is exciting stuff. Um, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about the the? I know I kind of did a quick introduction, but I'm sure you could do it so much better. Uh, the history of Matter and Form. How did you get started? Why did you uh, uh, decide to uh, start this company? Yeah, I mean, thanks for the introduction. It was actually um, probably better, better than I've ever introduced myself, so <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, we were, we were a couple of guys, uh, programmers and friends that um, you know, were messing around in, in the shop. We were actually trying to uh, create our uh, a, a kit for a 3D printer. This was at the very beginning of when 3D printers were just sort of taking off the start of the RepRap projects. And uh, we needed a part that was organic, uh, it was difficult to model in CAD programs, so it was only something that a 3D scanner would be able to do. And we looked at all of the existing solutions, things that we could use out there, and they were all 10000 or $50,000, yeah. which of course, you know, we were not going to be able to afford something like that. But we thought, you know, it seems like a, you know, uh, mechanically simply enough. Um, so we thought maybe, maybe we can do it uh, with some nice software and see see how it works. And mm -hmm. we had a prototype up and running a couple of weeks, and um, people cool. got really excited around us. Um, so we put it up on a, a crowdsourcing site called Indiegogo, and it blew up. Uh, we were the highest funded campaign outside of the U.S. in history. We're, we're a Canadian company, so we wow. were allowed on Kickstarter at the time. Wow! Congratu um, congratulations! Congratulations! So started the company. Wow! Congrats! Yeah, I you. mean, that, that kind of reaction must have made made you feel really good. Uh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it was it was pretty exciting, and I and you know it's it was it, what was so awesome about it is we got all these amazing people, um, probably a lot of your listeners um, that that were able to sort of be part of the process and very close to us. 
so we got to talk to them, you know, not unlike making a, a company from scratch, it's, it's a little different because you, you start with your customers and then you go from there. Otherwise, you know, I mean, instead of creating a comp company from a product, so it was it was good. It was a an interesting time for sure. Did you anticipate that kind of reaction for for, for this company? I mean, did it cut you? Did it catch you off guard, or you, you kind of said, "Oh, I knew it, we were going to get this kind of response." I mean, I mean, uh, it was and it, it proved more of a validation, or did it kind of surprise you? No, I mean, it, we we were planning to build them from from scratch in the shop, we were going to mold and cast some of the parts uh, in plastic and do them by hand. We were thinking we were going to make about a hundred of them and that would be very successful. We were, we were, I think we were looking for $80,000 in, on Indiegogo to, to get started mm -hmm. and, and make all of the units. Um, we ended up with half a million um, in 30 days. So it, um, yeah, it was, it was shocking to say the least. And uh, and then it was oh, very <laughs> overwhelming when we started to realizing what we had to do after that. So. Well, the, I mean, tell me, tell me, you're sitting there and you're watching Indiegogo, and you and you first you see the first dollar come in, and then you see like ten dollars come in, and then yeah, I mean, all of a sudden you see this money coming in. I mean, I mean, did you go? When did it, when did you say to yourself, "Oh my gosh, you know, <laughs> please stop, no more money"? <laughs> you know, what, what did you? I mean, <laughs> what what happened? Yeah, I mean, it was there's a there's a moment when you when like the, I think it was the first day we hit our or the first two days we hit our goal mm -hmm. um and so that was kind of like oh, oh man what what's going to happen um but but then there's a moment in between where you go okay um stop now or <laughs> go really really fast because there's like a there's like a dead area where the money is great but it actually puts you in a really bad position where you have to you have to think about mass manufacturing and uh, with without a substantial amount of money you can't really do that so it's it, there's like a, a gray area where you don't want to be stuck in. So we're sitting there like nervously biting our teeth saying, are we going to get through this gray area? But, um, well, but luckily we did. What so. was the gray area was what? I mean, uh, a lot of money, but not enough money? Is that what you mean by that? Not enough to afford the, the mass yeah. manufacturing, but too much to do by hand. Okay. That's right. Yeah. I mean, molds molds for us. Uh, well, I mean, it depends on the product, but molds are, are you know, to ten or even a hundred thousand dollars to to build mold for mass manufacturing. So for something like you know, if we hit eighty thousand dollars, it, it wouldn't be quite enough uh, to do a mold and then pay for all of the, you know, for the hundred and fifty thousand dollars, not enough to pay for all the plastics as well. Did, so did you, it would, it's uh, how did you know where to go? I mean, did you go to China? I mean, I mean, at this point, or did you find a a, a place in the, in the states? You know, that would. Make, I mean, how did you find? I didn't advisor Google. Yeah, I mean, how did what, yeah. just give us a little bit of the entrepreneurial guide here? What did you do? I mean, you sat down at Google and you said, okay, sure. you typed in mold, and then and then you found, oh, that's black mold. That's people come to your house and get rid of that. No, we don't want that kind of mold. I mean, <laughs> what, what, what? No, uh, yeah, you. I don't know. I mean, people came to us um, because you know it was getting around and it was becoming a little viral. Like the the, the video we did was was quite. Um, I guess people really liked the video, so. It got around a little bit, and people found it really interesting. And so people started reaching out to us about things that could be done. And um, we had people all over the world, um, you know, uh, which was a, a blessing and a curse. But we were Canadian. We we wanted to keep it in North America. We wanted to keep the manufacturing in North America. Mm -hmm. um, but we quickly realized that at the time, um, it's very very difficult to to do that. So we, we had to start looking around at other places in the world. But yeah, they just kind of things just kind of fall into place. You know, and you, you, you handle each little problem as you go. Were there a lot of quote unquote little problems or did things go pretty smoothly? I think the entire company is a, uh, <laughs> is a pile of solved little problems. You know, <laughs> it's a stack of little, little problems that have been solved back to back. Um, there's, there's everything like you, you know, you go into uh, manufacturing and you realize, you know, you're in. China, we, we manufacturers in, in China, but we're in the factory and there's a, you know, we, we suddenly realize that, um, you know, this, this one component that drives a motor isn't going to work and, and you have to, you know, solve it. Or uh, we realized or a better example is, you know, we, we finished our kicks, we finished our Indiegogo, it was successful. And then we realized, uh oh, we have to actually certify and ship these things to 30 countries around the world. Like, and we're two guys in the shop. Like, what are we going to do? Well, so, that's it. So you, you were um, you were two guys you were two guys in the shop. That, well, of course, you know, same thing with Apple. It was Jobs and Wozniak, two guys in their uh, their shop, their their garage. So it wouldn't be the first mm -hmm. time that happened. But the world, of course, has changed a lot since they did this, their thing back in the uh, 70s. 
uh, did you find it easier to uh, to to uh, to make this happen, or or more or less? I mean, I mean, you had some daunting challenges that you had to overcome to to to, to make all of this happen. Did you? Did you not? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know what it would have been like in the seventies. I, I think it's a little, definitely a little different now. I mean, there's a lot of um, startups and, and entrepreneurs and little tech companies around the world, and we we luckily get to work and, and have chats with a lot of them. Mm -hmm. You know, th we don't have a lot of competition from a 3D scanner side. 3D printers have a ton mm -hmm. of competition. You know, I think everyone who, who's into that knows there's like hundreds of them out there. Right. So, but we get, we get the, to be the friend of everyone. So we get to talk to everyone and, and that, that helps a lot because they're, they always know someone who can help us do X or Y and we, we everyone kind of shares information and, 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 and it becomes a, it's a very like, tight-knit community um, of entrepreneurs and businesses, uh, especially in, in Canada. Are you still the, the two guys, or are you expanded to more people uh, since all of this happened? No, I'm I'm sitting in my office now, which I didn't have an office before, and looking at 15 people. So that's um, so things have changed a little bit since then. Right. Now, did, nice. you, did, did you do all the hiring yourself, or, or did you get, get the people come on board and say, okay, you know, I'm going to handle all this for you, and everything, or, or did you want to keep, did you want to micromanage everything yourself? Well, um, a little bit of both, I guess. I mean, it's, <laughs> it, 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 you, you don't want to do everything yourself, um, you know, but uh, you, you kind of have to mm -hmm. uh, at the beginning, especially at the beginning. Um, mm. You know, now there's, it's, it's, a, it's a weird moment for me because it's, I think we're just coming up on three years, but it's a weird moment for me when I start hearing about people doing something that I have no idea what they're doing. Like they're going into a meeting and I have no idea what meeting they're going into and what they're talking about. <laughs> uh, that's a, that's a weird moment for me when, you know, we started and I knew everything about the company from, from, you know, every little facet that was going on. So it's hard um, to let, it's hard yeah, to let go. It really is. I mean, you know, it's hard to let go. Sure. It, it, everybody. And this is, this is fairly common too. I mean, did you have a lot of sleepless nights or, uh, or uh, during this process? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. 17 hour work days for, for <laughs> years, uh, for, for about a year and a half, just working day and night, weekend and weekday. And, um, but we have, we have a phenomenal team here. It's, um, we were very specific about who we hired and that has paid off uh, massively because the people here are passionate about what they do and they, yeah. they come to work and actually like their jobs and, mm -hmm. and it doesn't feel like work here. We, we all feel like friends well, doing something that we love together. So let me ask, just a little background. I mean, what, what was your background before? Did, were you working somewhere else? Did you have a job someplace else or did, uh, and, and did, when, how did you decide if you did, did you, what motivated you to give that up? If you did, I mean, well, well you mentioned that you created bevel, yeah, no, you know, to solve a problem that you were having. So obviously you were in some kind of related field. Um, actually, well, no, I wasn't, I was, I, I was, uh, I originally went to school for advertising and I was an art director for about 10 years um, doing like concepts for, for ads. And after that, I, I got really fed up with the industry and sort of went into programming because it was sort of my other passion. Um, and at the time I was working for, it was, it was my first um, uh, job outside of advertising where I was working with uh, a company making a video game and I was a flash programmer actually. Oh, um, good thing you and, got, good thing we you got out of that. Given the state of Flash, it's a good thing you're getting yeah. out of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was already kind of late in the Flash game, but mm -hmm. um, but you know it was all program. It wasn't it wasn't Flash animation, so mm -hmm. the, it helped to teach me about uh, programming properly. And then um, we were just building 3D printers because it was cool. That was mm -hmm. you know that's that was that was it. Um, that's why we made the scanner was for ourselves originally. Okay. Well, uh, and, and uh, one thing I want to touch on, you know, we've already covered, you know, so much off topic stuff, but uh, you mentioned that you were, you know, one of the largest Indiegogo outside of the US, uh, hugely popular. And I mean, we talk to 3D printing companies all the time and things like that. And we talk to people who do it as a hobby, but sometimes it's kind of hard to, to gauge just how far 3D printing is going to go. And I think you'd be a good person to ask. It's, uh, you know, obviously you had a lot of people interested in your scanner, you know, which is you know, part of the 3D printing. How big do you think 3D printing is right now? And how big do you think it, it, it's going to be? Um, well, I mean, if you, it, I, I, I hesitate to say because, um, you know, we're, we're on a different side of things, but I'll, I'll I'm, 
people know me as someone who's um, a bit skeptical about the 3D printing side, which is kind of weird because of uh, how close we are to, to 3D printing. Um, I think maybe about right now, about maybe a third uh, of, our, of our customers actually are using the scanner in conjunction with 3D printing somehow. Um, but that that two thirds of my customers that are that are have no intention of of using 3D scanning with um, 3D printers. So you know to to answer your question, I'm actually I, I'm not sure. I mean, 3D printing has has really grown outside of the you know the home FDM 3D printers. That it's grown a lot in the medical field, and it's it's grown a lot in in different ways. Um, but but you know the the actual like home 3D printer. I don't know if that's ever if that's going to continue, and, and we're already seeing, well, seeing companies starting to drop out well, I'm, I'm, uh, this year, actually. Well, I'm a little puzzled. That if, if your pro what is your product then for if it's not for 3D printer? You're, you're scanning things in 3D. What else can you do with it if you don't want to print, uh, take it to a 3D printer? What's the other, what's the other application? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what surprised me when we started, too, um, because we thought it was going to be for 3D printing, and that's what it was designed for. But what we found out was that um, the application for 3D imagery um, is much, much larger, um, kind of the same way that you would think um, uh, if you were back at the beginning of turn of the century where you're taking a photograph, you know, it's a, it's a very specific use case that you would take a photograph for as a sort of an archiving. But then all of a sudden you give people the tools to take a photograph and it's disposable. Um, the ways that you use it are, are far greater. Um, and, and the same thing with 3D, 3D scanning. You, you use it for archiving historical purposes, you use it for 3D printing, but there's a lot of science and research, um, metrology. I've got, forensic, I've, got, I've got customers who are in forensics that are um, you know, scanning dental molds. I've got um, people that are um, using uh, 3D printers to design jewelry or 3D scanning uh, items to design jewelry. Um, they, they are the ones that are using 3D printers in their services, but animation and video games are a big one too. They have nothing to do with 3D printing. Um, you know, it's a good starting place for an animator to, to create a model. Um, and then, of course, there's everybody else who, uh, if it was easy enough, um, could actually create a 3D model. Everyone else that would use it in a similar way that you use the phone camera, the camera on your phone. So, uh, and that's actually where the, the, the idea for the bevel came from. All right, so basically, yeah, it seems to me I'm going to talk about the bevel now. Uh, uh, that's the 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 consumer product. This is you're, you're aiming rather than having these really expensive 3D scanner uh, for uh, office or for for technology or whatever. Um, you, the bevel is a device that is designed for consumers with smartphones. Is that uh, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about the concept of the bevel? Because I understand that you actually debuted it at uh, CES this year. Yeah, that's right. We we got to show it off uh, a couple of weeks ago at CES. Mm -hmm. um, so the bevel is a clip that goes into your smartphone or tablet. It uses the headphone jack, um, and it's a it's essentially a laser, um, which is the needed component to be able to make, turn your phone into a essentially a three D scanner. Um, but the way that we designed it was to be really really simple to use, and you. To, to create a 3D photograph, um, you, you use it in the same way that you, you take a panorama with your phone. You kind of slide your phone over the, over the surface of what you're um, mm -hmm. trying to capture, and, and, right. it, and it gets you back a, a 3D photograph. Now, are you using the camera in the phone or in the bezel, or is it a, what, what, uh, the bevel? Uh, the bevel, yeah. Are you, use, is, are you using the camera in the phone? Is the bevel using the camera in the phone, or does it have its own camera? It uses, uh, no, it uses the camera in the phone okay. and all of the sensors in the phone as well. Mm -hmm. And it actually processes on the phone as well. So it's, it's, it's all inside the phone or the, or the tablet itself. Um, so there's no bandwidth. There's no like okay. uploading to the cloud or anything like that. Okay, so you're using the accelerometer in the phone. You're using the camera in the phone. Using all this stuff in the phone. What is the bevel <laughs> bringing to, uh, to the process? <laughs> so because it's a, it's a fixed source of light, um, so it's a, it's a laser. Um, mm -hmm. It allows us to calculate depth very accurately. So the, 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 what you get back is actually something that you can measure from. Um, you, can, uh, you, you can get actual real measurements from it. X, Y, and Z? Um, X, Y, Z? X, Y, Z coordinates you're That's saying? right. Wow. Yeah, it's like, uh, it's about the one to two millimeters in, in, in accuracy. Um, so you can say, if I 
I don't know, scan a, a person, um, the one use case would be, okay, well, I just want to take a photo of my friend. That's cool. You don't really need measurements for that sort of thing. But if I wanted to say, um, I don't know, I was a company who was designing custom shoes, uh, I could use the bevel uh, and scan my customer's feet. And now I actually have real measurements of their foot uh, to design the, um, you know, design the shoe around. And that's, that's the difference between a 3D scanner uh, that's sort of easy to use or, and, and a, um, you know, a, a, the, the sort of the, the, I hesitate to call them fake, but they're, mm. they're sort of like um, magic tricks that make it feel like 3D. <laughs> exactly. Well, the software is probably doing all the, 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 the secret sauce here with this. Uh, with, I mean, it's a minimal amount of hardware uh, in the bevel, right? And, and you're using the existing uh, camera and hardware that's in the phone, the accelerometer and all that. And then the, the software, I assume there's some sort of an app that you download. And that's what's doing all the number crunching and producing the final uh, 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 video image. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, you got to download an app. It's it's iOS or Android only right now. Um, but you download the app, and then it's it's what it's sort of it's what not only allows you to scan, but it also keeps all your uh, files and photos. And in the same way that you sort of have a gallery of images on your phone, this app um, works very much the same way. And if you want to share your photos with other people, you can do that too, right on the app, uh, the same way that you share regular photos. Uh, uh, now, now, each photo takes about how much memory uh, in, of the phone to take an image? I know uh, with the larger capacity phones <laughs> these days, you know, are, it's getting better. It's a yeah, it's a little, um, it's a little bit like how long is a piece of a string because it depends on. Uh, on who, or who, what mode you're in, and what what you're doing with it. Uh -huh. If you go quickly, the file sizes are much smaller. Um, it can be anywhere from, um, you know, five meg uh, mm -hmm. up to fifteen meg. Uh, but if you spend time and you're in a three sixty mode and you're really painting the object and really going around trying to capture lots of detail, um, you know, then the the size of it can can grow drastically. It's it's really what's uh, what's capable of your what your phone is capable right. of. Uh, is, is the limit there, and then and then of course I assume that, that you then offload the images to your computer or or send it up to the cloud or that type of thing, so you can uh, you can have mm -hmm. even more. Um, I've got a lot more questions about this, but uh, I, I have to ask you this question: um, In light of Apple announcing their um, uh, iPhone Seven, <laughs> one of the things that the, that that a lot of people are are saying that because uh, the moment you said it, it hit the bell, is that the headphone jack is maybe going away. How is that going to affect you if uh, that, in fact, happens for, with the bevel? Have you had any thoughts on that? Oh, yeah. Um, you know, it's uh, the, the headphone jack, was, we, we picked it to be universal. Um, we're not going to just abandon the iPhone 7 users, but it will be something that comes after. Um, if Apple decides that they're not going to use a, um, a headphone jack, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll make sure to have a, a, an attachment that will work with Bluetooth um, and that might actually be the next iteration of the product as well. Okay, so that's a natural, uh, a natural uh, e uh, evolution. Um, that, uh, it's, mm -hmm. uh, but it's at least, at least you're, they're not going to pull the carpet out from you. You know, you're you're, you're aware of it. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> that maybe that's one of those meetings yeah, that you're not. I, I mean, I, I, <laughs> that you weren't sure what's going on. <laughs> And I don't know how I feel about the, the, the iPhone 7 losing it um, outside of the bevel, but, you know, yeah. I, I, I like my wireless headphones, but still. Well, they're, they're talking... It's they're interesting ta what they're trying to do there. Yeah, they're, make, they're talking a lot about uh, making a lot more wireless. Even the, the, the earbuds are going wireless, you know, the, no more headphones. Mm. Like, there's a lot yeah. of stuff that they're talking about and, 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 uh, and cordless uh, charging. They're, they're talking about a lot of new innovations that might be coming out for this next generation iPhone. Um, getting back to the uh, bezel. So, um, bevel. The, the, what did I say? What did you I keep say? saying? Bezel. Bevel. I'm sorry. <laughs> bevel. Uh, <laughs> okay. My apologies. Uh, yeah, the bevel. Um, <clears throat> so you, you, the, I assume you download the app. It's a free app, and then, and, and, it's, and then, um, it, it just kind of walks you through. But how much time uh, till you become proficient? Does the average person take to become proficient with this? It's it's very very quick. Uh, it, it like I said, it, it works very similarly to taking a um, panorama. And if you go to be if you want to be a little more proficient and you want to actually capture things that you can 3D print, like full 360s, um, not just sort of 3D photographs that are um, 
you know, quick representations. It just depends on what you need. But if you want to spend more time with it and actually, um, you know, and actually become more proficient, it's it's similar to like learning surround shot on the Android or, uh, you know, just just a few little uh, simple tricks to help you get the best results. But um, you know, it's meant to be usable. It's meant uh, it's it's sort of designed with you know someone like my mom in mind to be able to use this sort of thing when my mom's not very good with with computers bless her heart um <laughs> so now is the bevel available yet is it has it come out or is it uh what's the status it's still in pre-sale at the moment um if you are a kickstarter backer you'll know that we uh we hit a little snag and we didn't want to release the bevel um that it wouldn't work with a few devices so yeah. uh we needed to make some revisions and so it's pushed us back a little bit but we're going to be launching in, uh, we're going to be uh, shipping out, sorry, in May. Um, so, but it's on pre-order right now on our site um, for $79. Do you have some of them uh, out in the field? Uh, are you getting any kind of feedback on how people are going to be using the bevel uh, at this point? Yeah, we've had a lot of interesting conversations with people. Um, you know, I kind of ripped off the the idea of custom shoes, actually from a customer who is um, planning mm -hmm. to do exactly that. I hope he doesn't mind. Um, <laughs> you'll, be, you'll be hearing. Um, you'll but, be hearing. Yeah. You'll be hearing from his attorney. Yeah, and uh, I'll tell you what. Drew, yeah, when he's, when uh, he's, yeah, exactly. Drew, we're, gonna, we're at the bottom of the break, and uh, so we're gonna take a quick break here, some commercial messages, and then we'll get back to you because a lot more questions. Uh, this is a very cool product. Uh, all right, uh, we are talking to uh, Drew Cox. He is the uh, CEO and founder of Matter and Form. Uh, right now, we're talking about this amazing bevel product that will do 3D scans, works with your standard smartphone. Uh, we're going to take some, a break. A new statistical review is on the platter as well. We'll be right back. You're listening to Computer America. Sometimes, disaster strikes. Data can be lost due to many different reasons. Accidental reformatting, power spikes, virus attacks. Zero Assumption Recovery provides a suite of highly effective and thorough data recovery software for Windows operating systems. ZA is suitable for home users and small businesses who need a powerful data recovery solution for Windows and Linux file systems. Go to z-a-recovery.com. Sometimes, disaster strikes. Data can be lost due to many different reasons. Accidental reformatting, power spikes, virus attacks. Zero Assumption Recovery provides a suite of highly effective and thorough data recovery software for Windows operating systems. ZA is suitable for home users and small businesses who need a powerful data recovery solution for Windows and Linux file systems. Go to z-a-recovery.com. Hi, this is Craig Crossman, host of the Computer America Show. You have important meetings to schedule. Your company's getting ready for its IPO. And you're in charge of the PTA fundraiser this month. So how do you coordinate everyone to be available at the same time? Are you still using emails, phone calls, even text messages to schedule meetings with a group of people? How's that working out for you? <laughs> That's so great, huh? It's a fact that every day, millions of people suffer from scheduling headaches. Well, with Doodle, scheduling meetings with a group of people is quick and easy. With Doodle, you can easily propose available times to each member. Each one checks off the times that they are available, and then you simply pick the time that works best for the group, all in an easy-to-read display that integrates with your existing calendar. Nothing could be more simple. Give Doodle a try for free, and like millions of Doodle users, you'll truly see how easy it is to find the perfect date and time for all your meetings. That's www.doodle.com. Pat, she's a self-made stocking stuffer. Hi, I'm Marty Winston with a News Tips Bulletin Review for Computer America. This time, the Maker's Guide to the Zombie Apocalypse. Getting past the zombie gimmick, Simon Monk's The Maker's Guide to the Zombie Apocalypse from Starch Press is a guidebook to using simple circuits and mostly scavenged parts to make interesting things happen. Many of the projects build on Arduino or Raspberry Pi boards using simple things like micro switches, lights, horns, LEDs, and webcams. With simple stimuli and responses, the controller instructions also stay simple. He even tells how to strip and solder wires. Lost art, right? Bottom line, we can't think of a less stressful way to get into cobbling together cool stuff 
than the projects that the Maker's Guide to the Zombie Apocalypse inspires. Marty Winston, News Tips Bulletin for Computer America. Welcome back to the Computer America Show. It is 33 minutes past the hour, and we are talking to Matter and Form, uh, Mr. Drew Cox, who's the CEO and founder, as we talk about this bevel device. And um, yeah, not not bezel, bevel, bevel, <laughs> we got that. Um, but yeah, no, uh, I was actually out of CES as well. I believe I saw bevel out there. Um, I may have actually, like, I have a ton of cards. I probably have one of your cards. Um, and, and I met the guys out there. It was, you know, just, you were right when you said that CES was, was crazy and, uh, you get some kind of like tech hang hangover or something like that. <laughs> but, um, there was definitely a lot of hype around 3d printing and, uh, you know, and all the assorted gadgets, including, uh, scanning. And, you know, the, of course, they had different areas. So there was, you know, uh, hundreds upon hundreds. But there, there there were a few competitors. So, and I, I will admit most of them were souped up webcams, I, I, I feel like, with, uh, you know, with the software behind it. But I guess I'll, you know, just let you answer this. How do you differentiate yourself, uh, you know, from all the other people out there? You know, competitors, ex exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, um, the the biggest way that we we try to differentiate ourselves is is actually through the the usability of the software. We're trying to uh, it's it's what goes into the design of the the actual physical product and and the design of the software itself. We concentrate on trying to break down the barrier for people um, that are getting into 3D, and those those barriers are actually quite quite high. They're they're originally made by programmers. Um, in, in programs like, you know, Autodesk and, and uh, Maya, mm -hmm. They're, those are difficult programs to learn. And, you know, so we, we want to be able to make it easy for people. Um, so we focus on that. The other part is that, um, you know, we're, we're very heavily focused with uh, laser 3D scanning, um, which is a type of 3D scanning that um, has uh, a few advantages over over some of the other ways. Um, so that I could list them all off. There's things like photogametry and um, infrared scanning, but photogametry is a, a really interesting subject, but it doesn't give you scale. You can't actually use the part uh, afterwards unless you have some sort of point of reference. Hmm. Um, so that's the other way is that we, and then the other thing about laser scanning is that it's incredibly detailed. Uh, so you get really good, really good details back from it that you don't get in other, um, other forms of 3D scanning. Now, when you take a picture uh, with the uh, uh, bevel, uh, and mm -hmm. you, you look at it, can you literally rotate it? You know, around the, you see the image. Can you spin it, rotate it, that type of thing, so it, it appears to be uh, on the the phone or on your computer? I mean, how do you, how do you how do you deal it? How would you, you can do a, yeah, you can do a lot with it. Actually, it's um, you, you it's it's very intuitive. Yeah, you take a photo and. Then you spin the photo and with your finger, and it and it's uh, it's something that you kind of do almost naturally, um, and then it's full 3D. It's almost like um, it, it, I don't know. It feels a bit like magic to me, even though that I I'm you know <laughs> the one that helped design it. So, yeah. um, but then you could also use it in VR. Uh, so some of our systems work with um, the Oculus. We're also planning to uh, make it work with. Um, uh, Samsung and uh, with Google uh, Cardboard, ah. so you you can actually s just snap it into your into your Google Cardboard and and view it in 3D that way if you're if you are so inclined. So um, yeah, there's lots of ways so, that you can kind of. So in other words, you could sort of like walk around the if, if it's like a, a, a let's say it's a statue on the on the table and you've done so then you can literally walk around it. Uh, with you know, with the 3D glasses is what you're what you're aiming to you, do. You would be able to if if the VR headset allows you to do that. Unfortunately, they don't. They, they they're just like a it's a fixed point of view, and then you can just sort of move your head and look around. Yeah. Um, but some of the other some of the the newer VR stuff actually lets you walk in a space and view in a space, and so. Um, well, you know, it, it does work with that, but yeah. you need to set you need to set up for well, it. I remember the uh, presentation. I mean, there's there's software applications out there. I think one's called Jenga, which is uh, basically you you have it on your iPhone and you enable it, and then you literally can walk. You walk around the object. You physically walk around it, and you can see it from all the different perspectives, as though you were looking at it in a table. And that you can do that on your iPhone. 
So I'm assuming that you would have something similar this to the, what you're photographing with the uh, bevel or something along those lines. Yeah, there's. I don't. I don't tell a lot of people this, um, but there is actually a mode on the on the phone. I'm, I'm thinking about making it an Easter egg, <laughs> but it's a it's an augmented reality mode. So it, once you've taken or shared a, a photo um, of say an object, mm -hmm. you can bring that photo up on in the app, and you can project it. Uh, onto uh, like a, a surface or an area, um, obviously on your screen, you would cool. view it. So you got a video of what you're seeing in real real life, um, augmented with this object that you can walk around and, and sort of lean in and lean out of and get you know get closer to or get farther away from. Um, but it's a it's a mode that kind of makes it feel like it's right in front of you, even though it was maybe sent from a friend halfway across the world. That's so cool. That really is. Don't make that an Easter egg. I would make that a feature. You know, I mean, like, you know, with the arrows pointing well, here. Try it's this. Our, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's not our focus. So I, I you know, it's um, it's part of what runs the the mm -hmm. back end of our our software is kind of augmented reality based. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to make an Easter egg because I don't want to I don't want to make any promises. That's all. Uh, well, I I predict it'll be so popular that you're just going to turn that into a feature. Uh, I would think so. Arcade mode. So, yeah, arcade mode. I mean, I mean, uh, let's face it. People love cool things like that, and to be able to do that and demonstrate that, and not hide it somewhere, you know, uh, as a surprise, mm -hmm. I think it would be would be. Uh, that's my two cents. Yeah, you, I don't know if it's in the first revision, but maybe the next revision you should make it a you know an actual feature. Since you, since uh, you I think you might be right. Yeah, since you already have it, you should really just, why not? You know, it's there. Just make it available. Um, so um, so you said that it'll be available for purchase when in March, you're saying? It, it's it's going to be delivered. Uh, we're going to try for to, for delivery in May. May. Sorry, um, but you can pre-order it. Yeah, we can pre-order it now um, on our site. And we're going to be doing a few... Um, exclusive events for for actually selling outside of our uh, our site in when when we can actually ship the product, mm -hmm. um, but I think the price uh, may not stay at seventy nine. It might go up to ninety nine when we release. So right. uh, we're still still trying to fight that and make sure that comes down. But no, I'm, I'm saying, now is it going to be only on your website, or you, will you be able to get it at things like Amazon or Best Buy? I mean, where 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 do you where are you targeting this for? Uh, it'll it'll be our site for now, and then it, once it once we're delivering, I, I'm pretty sure it's going to be Amazon. Um, we already ship our 3G scanners through uh, Amazon, so mm -hmm. that makes sense. Um, but we also have a lot of brick and mortar stores across the store or across the world, uh, and a lot of uh, online stores across the world. So um, it shouldn't be too hard to find. There's um, you know we're we're also being looking into new new stores that we've never been into for, before, like photo stores, like photography photography stores that don't sell, ah. uh, you know, 3D printers and computers. Because uh, there's a lot of photography enthusiasts that are looking at trying to get into a new medium uh, and try it out. So, so that's interesting as well. And not only that, and if it's such a small price for 79 or 99 bucks, I mean, I mean, still, uh, that's a very, very small price to get into 3D uh, photography, uh, scanning. Uh, I think that, uh, yeah. uh, I, I think that, I think, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I, was just gonna say, I think I think you you, you kind of have to have to make it as as affordable as possible. I mean, it's not three D is such a difficult thing to to learn. Like I said, and and um, if it's going to become it, whether it's us or not, three uh, D is going to replace or at least be be not replace, but become as ubiquitous as as two D photography is. Um, it's going to be uh, easy. We, we we've already seen things like. The real sense come out, uh, which is part of a tablet, and we, you know, there's there's photogrammetry type of apps out there, and and there's lots of really interesting ways that you can start to create 3D content. Even even the, the Nintendo 3DS can take 3D photos, and that was uh, what five or six years ago. So, right. um, you know, that it's it's going to be a thing. Um, but uh, we, we're just trying to make it really really super easy, and the way to do that is to make it small and make it easy to to use, and and um, you know, make make it just the, the invisible to, to the technology that they already use is really the goal. Um, so, you know, price, price point is a big, big point of that. Exactly. Um, and you obviously have gone through the, uh, the entrepreneurial process and we kind of discussed that to the beginning. I know a lot of our listeners are, are sort of a, they have an idea, they've got something, uh, you've been through a lot of it. 
uh, and uh, and you're still actually into it. So if you could provide some advice to our listeners who are kind of looking to introduce a product in the marketplace, uh, any lessons learned that you want to share with them? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, you know, being being passionate and being sure about what you want to do and not not making compromises. I'm I'm a big fan of um, you know the idea that a compromise is a death of any good idea. Um, you know, I try not to be a jerk, but um, <laughs> but I don't I don't like to think about an idea getting ruined because uh, you're trying to make a compromise. So as long as you've got that resolve, I think, uh, and then and then of course um, you know that old adage where your, your customers are always right and, and they are, they should always be number one for you. Um, so, you know, we've tried to focus on that and that's really, really helped us because uh, our customers are, have, have helped us through some of the worst times uh, in the company and they've, they've been right beside us uh, giving us ideas and, and help. So, um, you know, just keep, keep them close to you for sure. Have you, have you, uh, I mean, why did you decide not to? I mean, go to like the the, the Shark Tank route, you know, venture capitalists, and you know, and is Mark uh, even so scary? <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> were you? I mean, I yeah, I watch the show from time to time, and I see a lot of tech products, small little tech products, you know, uh, that, that that come that are that are terrific ideas. I, you know, and then they're throw, and they wind up throwing lots of money at them. Uh, I mean, uh, have you thought of looking for venture capitalists, or why did you decide not to go that route, and you went the Indiegogo route? Um, we we actually well we we've done both so Indiegogo was to uh, was what got us started and then we did a uh, we did a venture round um, uh, our first seed round um, I think it was like uh, la it was last not last year the year before um, and but if there's any investors out there that want to throw money at us I'm, I'm happy to listen <laughs> to them right now <laughs> That's well, no problem <laughs> but did you do that I mean you you actually made a presentation I mean you you to these uh, venture capitalists or or angel investors or yeah I mean lots of lots of people uh there was um you know angel investors here in canada and there's uh investors across the world i've, I've had presentations um what kind of reaction forms uh, of, what kind of reaction did you get from those people just out of curiosity well when we when we were originally presenting it was just the desktop um, ah. and the bevel was just a glimmer a glimmer in our eyes mm -hmm. um the reaction very much uh, was uh, focused around 3D printing at the time because yeah. it was just taking off and being such a hype. With the bevel now, when I talk to uh, new people, I think I think people get really excited about um, the idea that that it's it's breaking into a new space that that mm -hmm. people haven't been able to do before, and I think that's what gets people mostly excited. Um, you know, and 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 Cashy, which is the 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 back end that we don't really talk about but it's the it's the back end that that shares the content it's the social side of things and right. it's what helps link to facebook and it's your cloud service um you know that that doesn't exist uh really really well right now um and mm -hmm. cashew sort of its first of its kind so people get really excited about that as well okay well so you're getting good reactions uh you mentioned something uh you're calling a genuine 3d and it's got the trademark genuine 3d photography is that what you're calling this process what is genuine 3d photography we we call it genuine 3d because uh you know there, there's a lot of, like I said, there's a lot of uh, apps and things that are, are I, I love them. They're very cool, um, but they're, they're sort of, um, uh, what do we call it, not gimmicks, but like kind of magic tricks. So, um, you know, that, that give you the illusion of, of 3D. There's a really phenomenal one uh, called Fuse, and it's, a, it's essentially a video, um, and you, you scrub the video back and forth, but because of the way that you moved the camera around whatever you're doing it kind of looks 3d it has a very 3d thing but there's no actual 3d to it it's it's still just a video you can't 3d print it you can't use it in a video game you can't get measurements from it um and so we, we instead of having 3d photography which is kind of a you know people kind of use 3d uh just like 3d printing people use that word to describe a lot of different types of technologies even uh -huh. if they're 3d printing or not we wanted something that was going to you know be maybe used in a, in a more traditional, like in a, in a real sense. So um, genuine 3D was, uh, was the, the term that we came up with that really defines a, a photo in 3D that you can actually use, has real geometry to it. Um, you know, it, it can be saved as a, an OBJ or an STL file, which if you're into 3D, you know what those files are. Um, so it, it's an actual 3D file that you can use. And that, that, 3D, uh, so that, that's, our, that, 
That 3D file that you mentioned can be used with the other pro programs like uh, uh, that use 3D printers, Autodesk, that type of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Autodesk and, and ZBrush, or if you're an, you know animating, um, mm -hmm. or if you're 3D printing, you can use it with your 3D printer. Or you know, we 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 link to a bunch of 3D printing services as well, um, so you can use our our lots well, of uh, you know we link up to Shapeways and and 3D Hubs, which are services that you send the model to, and they'll send you back the the full 3D printed part. Um, so yeah, you can actually use the file in, in, in any sort of real way. What kind of resolutions are you dealing with here? I know, uh, especially with especially with the bevel. What kind of what kind of resolutions are you obtaining? We're sort of we're, I'm working with a company right now that's um, it's actually a charity who who works with 3D printing replacement limbs um, for people who can't afford replacement limbs. There, we're trying to um, we're trying to get a certain amount of accuracy for them. So I'm aiming for a one millimeter accuracy on the bevel in order to allow them, specifically them, to be able to um, scan people's appendages and, and fit properly to them. Um, but the you know for the average person, um, resolution is dependent on um, you know what your end result. Uh, one millimeter accuracy, but but the detail could be. Um, very broad, uh, depending if you're standing very far away from a subject, or if you walk closer and you get more detail on someone's face, uh, for example. Um, you can have a model that has multiple uh, resolutions to it. So kind of like, um, you know, if I took a photo of someone from standing down the road, they're going to be really tiny and maybe a couple pixels tall, but then I can pair that with a photo that's really close to them and have all the detail of their face. Um, our file kind of combines them together. So you can have a face that's really highly detailed, but then the body is, is low detail. Um, and it's just part of, it's just part of how you choose to capture the, the subject that you're, that you're capturing. So, if is that the, makes sense? Yeah. No. But is and now is the resolu resolution dependent upon the DPI of the camera that you're using? Obviously, you're using in the iPhone. You're using the 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 built-in camera of the phone, or if you're using an Android, you're using a you know that could be anything that they 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 vary widely. Are you limited by the DPI of the camera? Is that the limiting factor? Um, how does that work? Um, no, there, because because there's so many cameras, we we actually tried to. Uh, n like normalize everything and try to make it the, the same user experience no matter what device you have. Um, so resolution is actually dependent on how you want to, like I said, like how you want to actually capture the person or the or the, or the, the thing that you're trying to capture. Um, so uh, the, the best example I can explain is I've got a friend and I'm taking a photo of them in a in a restaurant. Um, so I stand back just like I would with a regular photo, and mm -hmm. he's in frame, and I, I capture him. But then I go and walk forward to him, and I paint uh, the laser over his face uh, to capture more detail. Mm -hmm. And um, and so then, it, depending on how close I can get to the uh, to the subject, it will give you more resolution in that area. It also depends on the type of phone you have because the headphone jack is different for every phone in relation to the camera. So um, if it's closer to the camera, like some of the Android phones have the headphone jack right on top of the camera, you can actually get really, really close to things. But uh, your accuracy for farther things that are farther away uh, is not quite as good. But the iPhone 6 is sort of the opposite. It has the headphone jack on the opposite side. So you've got really much better detail and accuracy for things that are farther away, but you, you can't scan anything closer than I think about a foot and a half on the iPhone 6. Right. So a, uh, it just depends on what you've got. Does you know you hear lasers and you always have the, you get these knee jerk reactions you know you can't shoot laser pointers at airplanes and things like that uh, you know don't point a laser in your eye I mean if you're taking a picture of somebody's face uh, is the laser in the bevel going to present any kind of a, a physical problem for the person you're photographing? No, I mean we've we've certified everything to be absolutely safe. Um, the the laser itself is actually much 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 less. It's like it's very, very similar to just a, a bright LED, like a flash on your camera. Um, and in fact, uh, it, if you want to compare it to, you know, it's way less uh, in bright than, say, like the sun reflecting off of a car window or something like that. So oh. it's, it's super safe to use. It's, it's really just, um, it's actually less bright than your flash is on your phone. Uh, so it, it's super safe to use. Okay, uh, but it is in the visible light spectrum. You can see a dot or something uh, from the uh, the bevel. 
when, when, that, yeah, we had to put it in the red spectrum um, mm-hmm. because that was the, um, the that was what was going to work the best with every phone. Mm-hmm. Um, some phones have infrared capabilities, and I'd love to put it in the infrared, but um, well, that's that's not every phone. Well, so. when you have a red dot on though, that what prevents the red dot being picked up in the final photograph? I mean, uh, how how do you get uh, magic? <laughs> <laughs> we. We do. We, do, rely, some, we do some mathematical you, magic. Let's you, just put it that. You rely a lot on magic in your company, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, secret so, thoughts is all. Secret I can says so because the red dots there, but you say you somehow uh, phase that out so you don't actually see it. Yeah, it's a it's a red line, and then you you paint the line over the subject, and because you're moving. Uh, the line you're painting over it, we're, we we sort of take textures from one side and apply it to the other, and mm-hmm. and we, we you know we do some Photoshop magic and and make it look great. You never see the laser. All transport, all again, all transparent to the end user. They don't anything, nothing they have to be concerned with. <laughs> no, you don't. It's it's very very invisible to the user. Actually, yeah. uh, no one they don't really see any of this. It just kind of happens, happens. for them. Well, that's what you um, want. That's what yeah, you want. More- yeah, uh, that's what you want, correct? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's. Um, there, I mean, I, I'm a. I'm a guy who likes to take things apart, right? Uh, mm-hmm. You know, but and I'm, I'm sure some of your listeners are are like me. But I, I mean, there are going to be uh, sort of the advanced features for when people want to go in and mess around and tweak with numbers. Um, mm-hmm. That's absolutely going to be part of it because that's where we came from. But if you just buy a bevel and you plug it in and you use it, it it pretty seamless it, it's okay. um it's a pretty simple simple way to use it okay the website that you want people to go to see this is what matterandform.net is that correct that's correct yeah and you can find out about the product there but we also have a cool blog at matterandform.net where you can um, see some of our updates from the kickstarter and we get much more technical about it but um so if you if anyone's ever interested, they can read stuff there too. Okay, and again, it's matter and form, just as it sounds. It's spelled the same way, A N D. Matterinform.net, and uh, it, and also if you you can just go to computeramerica.com. We have a link to the matterinform.net website right at our homepage at computeramerica.com. That's up there now. If you uh, if uh, you get lost or you want to find it, you can certainly do that and and check it out. And again. Uh, suggested retail price uh, pre uh, is seventy nine dollars. Uh, That's right. Yeah. Scheduled to come out in May uh, at this time, uh, and uh, then when it comes out, it may go up to ninety nine bucks or or wherever. But uh, that is a pre. And mm-hmm. yeah, and I just want to say it's, a, it's Android and iOS uh, only right now. We don't have a Windows version yet, uh, so just hang tight if you're a Windows user. Um, and well, um, a fairly you, modern, a fairly modern phone would be better. I think you're going to well, get a better. What are you going to do with the window? So if you have any questions, you can email us. Unless you had a Windows phone, what are you going to do? I mean, you're going to put it on your computer and then lift your computer up and walk around the person. No. <laughs> <laughs> that can be a little awkward. Yeah, exactly. Uh, no, but seriously. So Android, uh, iOS, and possibly a Windows version coming out uh, as well. Any thoughts of having a Mac version? <laughs> uh, well, I mean Windows Phone. Uh, ah, Windows you know, Phone. Like the, the okay, Microsoft okay. Surface. So got it. I, okay. I oh, the iPhone is Mac. Okay, it's iOS. All right. So there it is. So then you got all the platforms uh, really covered. Uh, Drew, uh, listen. Uh, I want to thank you for being here on the uh, show with us. It was very interesting. Uh, I thought very informative uh, from uh, not only the the 3D scanning uh, point of view, but also from uh, an investor and, and what you had to go through. Uh, uh, as an entrepreneur t- to make this happen. I think it was a very knowledgeable uh, and very insightful. And uh, Ben and I want to thank you for being here with us on the show. Yeah, thank you so much. I had a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, best of luck to you. And when it comes out again, you know, maybe in, in, in the May time frame, touch base with us again, you know, and then maybe we can uh, get a unit to, to do a review for you or something, okay? Yeah, for sure. We'll, we'll send you one for sure. Excellent. All right, Drew. Listen, thank you again for being with us here on Computer America. You have a great weekend, all right? Thanks so much. Take Bye, care. Guys. Okay, take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right, there you go. Uh, uh, Matter and Form, uh, the bevel. You can check it out at matterandform.net. And uh, 79 bucks for now. And uh, uh, I, I suspect we'll, we'll be getting a call from Microsoft, very angry before <laughs> long, uh, that Craig forgot that they make phones. So, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, we're awaiting your call. No, we, well, no, well uh, Carissa. 
Green, our, our booking. I guy. know. And yeah, she uses a Windows phone, but you're like, well, you know, why do you have a, a Microsoft platform? It's like, oh, yeah, that's right. They do make phones. <laughs> they do make phones. Yes, they do. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, I found that interesting. I really think that, the, especially what you had to go through to make all that happen. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, but I feel like his story is, uh, you know, very compelling and, you know, fun and all, but it's not that. It's not too dissimilar from what many new these tech startups that we hear about. You know, this tech startup, that tech startup. It's not too dissimilar from what they've had to go through. Now, did you? You went out to CES. You were there. Obviously, did you see Matter Inform? Did you see this product when you were? I think out? I did. I think oh. I did. Oh. I, so, and and again, I have. I hate that I have to use the word. I think because again, thousands of companies. I kid you not. Um, but yeah, I I I think I remember. Uh, matter and form and a lot of the uh, 3d scanning companies out there they're actually uh pulling people from the crowd and scanning them and then printing out little figurines <laughs> like right there on the spot to to do this so i uh, you know not only did i get to see the company but i, I got to see the product in action did they, very, make a, very cool. did they make a little figurine of you oh no 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 i uh i made sure i stayed far away from that <laughs> i don't need a little me <laughs> No mini figures or otherwise. No, no mini me's. Very bad. Okay. All right. Well, uh, it sounds really cool. I mean, I could see this on 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 my iPhone and to give it a try and take a three D picture that we kind of kind of need. I mean, I I, I like the uh, the panoramic of you that you can use because you can get so much more in it. So if it's very much uh, looking at the videos and everything, it's very much like the panoramic. Uh, you kind of just move the, around the object, and uh, it scans it in, uh, and then you have your image just that well. Very cool stuff. All right, uh, coming up in the next 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 hour, we're going to have uh, our social media winner of the week, and GeoTab is going is here with us. Uh, we've got the vice president of global sales and marketing, Colin Sutherland, is here. He's going to be talking about telemat telematics and what it is and what it is that it does for you. Uh, we're going to take a short break. And we'll be right back. You're listening to the Computer America Show. Stay with us. Broadcasting live, it's the only national radio talk show on computers to air every weeknight. Computer America, hosted by national columnist Craig Crossman. The first hour's behind us, but there's still more of tech news, tech talk, and your phone calls. We're being beamed nationwide at ComputerAmerica.com. You got computer problems? Bring them on. You're listening to Computer America. Computers run the world, and we run computers. Call us or send us an email to live at ComputerAmerica.com. Hello and welcome into hour two of the nation's longest running nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers. This is the Computer America Show, and I'm your host, Craig Crossman. And I'm your co-host, Ben. And we just had Matter Inform on the program, uh, all talking about 3D scanning, uh, a little de tiny device close to your iPhone or Android phone, um, and allows you to do 3D scans. For 3D photographs, real ones, not not phony ones, but actual 3D photographs. Um, we even talked about. I, I think the difference between real and phony that I, that I think he was really trying to drive home was you can get programs that will take photos that look like they're 3D and they have 3D effects. Mm -hmm. But I think his big point with this one was that you can actually derive measurements from right. this. Yeah, so. it's it, it's true 3D. It's not simulated in any way, and because of that. They even have augmented reality, uh, which I thought was really cool that they could do. He was disguising it as an Easter egg, and I told him, and he, I think I finally convinced him to make it an actual feature since they already well, have. Well, I see why, why he wants to hide it. It's because, you know, that's just not what it's there for. So, you know, if someone calls up and says, hey, you know, the, the, the augmented reality version sucks, what, what's up with that? <laughs> it's not really the point of the whole thing. So I can see why he wants to hide it. Yeah. Well, I still think he's just bringing that. Uh, let less people let people know that it's there. Um, anyhow, if you missed any portion of that, you can listen to the show again. We archive all of our programs here at ComputerAmerica.com. Just go to our website at ComputerAmerica.com. Uh, click on the Archives tab on any page, and you'll see all the different places that you can listen to archives of our show. It's on Apple's iTunes, uh, Stitcher, SoundCloud, uh, the Blog Talk Radio Network. Uh, they all archive our uh, show for your listening pleasure. And of course, if you're listening to us live Monday through Friday from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time, you can catch us also on things like the TuneIn Radio Network and the IRN Radio Network, 
all of them carry our live radio broadcasts. So um, anyhow, um, we're, we're going to have uh, the second hour. We're going to have our social media winner of the week where we're going to be giving away that beautiful Logitech uh, MX2 uh, MX Anywhere 2 wireless mouse valued at $80. Uh, some lucky person is going to be winning that. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, and of course, we still encourage you to watch our live video stream at computeramerica.com. Just click the uh, social media, social, uh, social, uh, what is it? The social, la the lounge, the show there lounge. Yeah, show yeah, lounge. Show lounge. Yeah, the show lounge. And then you'll be uh, joined to the show already in progress where you can watch the live video where Ben has, uh, can display websites, movies, videos, backgrounds, that type of thing. All right. Um, anything else uh, you want to mention uh, before we uh, uh, get, go to our next guest? No, no, I think, uh, I think we're good. Okay, good. Well, our next guest is uh, from a company called Geotab. And for over a decade, uh, Geotab has been a proven industry leader in the area of fleet management and vehicle tracking technology, also known as telematics. There it is. Geotab's advanced telematics is used to manage employee productivity and significantly reduce accidents. This is very cool. Now, here with us is Geotab's Vice President of Global Sales and Marketing, uh, Colin Sutherland. Colin, welcome into Computer American. How are you? Yeah, I'm great, Craig. Uh, ben, thanks for thanks for inviting me to join you on this fantastic Friday. Appreciate uh, your uh, appreciate your interest in our company. Absolutely. Our pleasure. Yeah, our pleasure. So uh, again, I, you heard my introduction, but why don't you tell our listeners basically who is Geotab? A little bit of company background here. Yeah, so. Thanks for that. You know, it's uh, the industry we're going to talk about over the next, uh, you know, few minutes, hour. Um, it's this telematics sector, and you're right, Geotab and even telematics isn't really a well-known company name for vast majority of your listeners, or even the consuming public. Um, so our company began in this fledgling industry about 20 years ago. Uh, now we have 200 employees, mostly um, circuit board designers, firmware engineers, software developers, technical services folks, really um, who have grown from a small group of people. We were only 10 people uh, 16 years ago. And uh, really, you know, our company's grown on the back these days of the internet of things and cloud computing and the interest of people to understand more, especially the business people, understand more about um, how vehicles drive, where they are, how safer are our drivers. So it's location-based services, and we'll get into more detail, I guess, over the next uh, few minutes. But our company is really one of those fortunate fortunate um, businesses that, that identified an industry which today represents about an $18 billion opportunity. Uh, that's the size of the business. It's one of the fastest growing sectors in uh, computing technology that we're really fortunate. Our industry is growing by about 40 or 50 percent per year. Um, we're just doing it year over year, frankly. I think over the last seven or eight years, we've been growing by 40 or 50 percent every year. Um, and it's uh, not expected to change anytime soon. So we still think we have about a 40 or 50 percent growth rate this year, next year, right through 2020. So it's just one of those really interesting, probably not well known um, technology sectors that your listeners are going to learn all about. So basically, uh... Uh, you don't have to rely on that bumper sticker that says, how's my driving? Call 1-800. You know, that's, you know, you don't have to develop, you don't have to worry about that anymore uh, because we have technology. Right. Exactly. Uh, that will, uh, that will keep track of this. So uh, now the system is comprised basically of two components, which is what a, a, a hardware component and a software component. Uh, then th th these devices, I assume kind of work together, uh, when there's like a, 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 a GPS tracking, vehicle tracking device, uh, the, the Go 7, is that where it all begins? That's right. So in the vehicle, you would have a device that, that we manufacture, design ourselves, um, that's been evolving over the years that connects to the engine data port on a car. So every car into your vehicle has a diagnostic connector that if you take your vehicle into a service shop, oh, you yes. can use that to read mm -hmm. the fault codes and scan tools. So we're going to connect our device into that port in the vehicle, the truck or car. Mm -hmm. And from there, I'm going to get power and I'm going to be able to get GPS location of the vehicle. I'm going to know all of the fault codes that are happening in that vehicle. And we're going to send that information over the air by cellular network 
through a gateway environment that's going to transmit the data in a secure way. So we have no data loss. Our customers need to know exactly where the data is going. Uh, there's no loss of data in the transmission over the cellular network, and it's got to be secure. And then ultimately, it goes into a cloud computing environment where we process the data. So right, there's a software component to it. Um, there's a cellular wireless component to it. It's really important. And then there's, of course, the hardware that goes into the vehicle. Now, uh, can I, let's say, uh, uh, using your system, uh, pull up on my computer screen, I can see a map, and I can see a little blinking dot, dee, 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 and I can actually follow a vehicle like they do, you know, let's say, in, in law, law enforcement shows and everything. If I want to actually track the vehicle, uh, your device, I could use your device to do that type of thing? Yeah, so we, I mean, that that was really the first use case, I think, of the technology 20 years ago mm. was to be able to locate where a vehicle is on a map. Uh, and dispatchers wanted to know where vehicles were because from a customer support perspective, it was very helpful to know when you've got a homeowner that needs to have a service call, mm -hmm. you need to know where your vehicles were at, and they need to dispatch the closest available person to the homeowner. And the technology was used for that. It's matured over the years, uh, but that is... Right. For the vast majority of us, we understand what a what a dot on a map is. Even on our phones, we can track things on a map these days with Google Maps. It's it's no different. So now, is this something that uh, that a, a person would use on a personal level, or is this something strictly, let's say, for you know, for companies to use because they have a fleet of vehicles and they want to keep track of those or taxi cabs? Or the, is it designed for for really for enterprise or, or large businesses, or who's who's the product uh, being used by today? Yeah, well, let me let me sort of draw a distinction between consumer use and 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 business use. And there are there are two different uses of the technology. If you don't mind, I can spend sure. a little bit of time. Sure, please do. Please talk do. about the two different mm -hmm. cases, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the majority of of your listeners have probably seen uh, insurance company talking about a program where you can have a little device connected to your vehicle, and the insurer is going to record something from your vehicle. You don't really know probably very much what they're going to be recording, but they're going to record something. Mm -hmm. And based on your your performance or behavior behind the wheel, you may qualify for an insurance discount. Mm -hmm. That's a good consumer use of telematics. Uh, primarily uh, in the consumer case, what they're looking at is um, distance driven. They really want to know how many miles you're driving every single day. So the more drive miles you drive, mm -hmm. the more possibility is that you're going to have an accident. So they look at the miles you drive, they may look at your speed, they may look at over RPMing, but the engine over revving the engine. Mm -hmm. But primarily they're looking at the distance and some case some cases they're looking at location. Some states are not allowed to look at location. California, really? for personal insurance, you can't use location as one of the um, pieces of data. Well, but on the business well, they're side, very progressive over in Cal they're very progressive over there in California, I guess. <laughs> uh. Yeah, right. They are, right? And that's I mean that's an important aspect for mm -hmm. Uh -huh. For consumers, it's really important that we're recording just the information that the consumer needs to have. Uh -huh. And, and, and that's, that's a pretty well-known aspect of telematics technology that, that most of us would be somewhat aware of. So you're connecting something to a vehicle and you're getting data back. Uh -huh. um, in the fleet world, the business world, it's far more sophisticated than that. The, the device itself um, has three primary sensors. So it's got that GPS and we do an amazing job of locating uh, the vehicle. It's not just the current location, but we can use the GPS to look at the entire trip. Um, in some cases, um, if you're a business, let's say you're a police for, uh, law enforcement, or if you're in the waste management industry, you need to know precisely what roads you drove down. If you're a road supervisor, you're supposed to drive every street in your jurisdiction to look for potholes, and you need to go and have some backup that says, yeah, you actually did drive every street in case a citizen says it's a pothole, you haven't repaired it yet. They're going to get on the back of the of the supervisor and just make sure that he, in fact, did drive that stretch of road. Same thing mm -hmm. right now. I'm, I'm up in the north, and we've got snow and ice. You want to make sure that all the roads are safe. So they monitor supervisor vehicles so that they're driving every single um, stretch of road, not just the busy highways, but also the little tiny rural streets. Mm -hmm. uh, it also has a really cool technology called an accelerometer. You guys are probably aware yep. of an accelerometer, which detects motion. Um, well, we do some really interesting work on that accelerometer. We don't want to know when you go over a railroad track. So that's just noisy data. I don't want to know if you go over a speed bump. Um, but I do want to know if you harsh brake. I want to know if you swerve aggressively. If you harsh brake, it's a leading indicator that one day you're going to have 
a rear end collision. So the more, uh, if you're a driver and I can score the number of harsh braking incidents you have in any given week or month, I can predict that you're probably a candidate for a rear end collision. And I need to get back to you and have some training on you're following too close. And I need to go and help, help, help you back off a little bit on your driving behavior there. Wow. And then on the engine diagnostic side, pulling a VIN is incredible. You have to be able to pull a VIN number to be able to match the vehicle type. And now I can tell you what your fuel economy performance is. I can look at um, your over revving the engine, which is wasteful for fuel. For over revving the engine is also aggressive for, for jackrabbit starting. That's also bad behavior. Sure. Mm-hmm. Um, so I can help you become more safe behind the wheel. I can help you save fuel by looking at your driving habits. As your check engine light comes on, I can re- remotely diagnose the vehicle, and we can have you predictably say, this engine light's on. You need to bring your vehicle in for service on an urgent basis, or my wife just called and said that her check engine light came on today. Turns out it's just a, a regular maintenance interval. I was able to look at that over the air. I looked up the code and said, oh, no, it's fine. You just need to do an oil change. You can go and schedule that at any time in the next five to ten days. So she's not worried. So it's really good use of the technology. And, and in the world, they're using that for a number of different really really important business purposes. Sorry, Craig. And, 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 and that's the thing that gets me. It's like, I think people would really like to be able to see more information about their car. I mean, they own these things, they have to maintain them, they have to care for them. But, you know, the, the workings of the car, immediately, you know, they're getting better with all the, you know, uh, with, you know the more they become more like computers, the, the, the better they're becoming. But I think people would really like that kind of information, easy at hand and re- re- easy to uh, access. But it's, Oh, you know, not impossible to find a consumer solution that's really uh, ubiquitous on the business side of this. Right. And on the business side, we need even more data so that the business is looking for very accurate data on a very timely basis, where for consumers, you know, we may not need to know exactly where the vehicle is every given second. We might be happy to see the data update every five minutes or so. Uh, we may not want to manage jackrabbit starts and following too close as a consumer but on the business side we have to pay for large insurance claims and and large insurance policies i need to make sure that my drivers are safe behind the wheel Um, and we don't want we want to prevent accidents from even happening and uh, using the technology that we have you know we feel that on an annual basis we've saved about 10 or 12 thousand accidents per year because we're coaching drivers in real time based on their driver behavior so it's really very useful technology. And is Geotab focused primarily on, on the latter and not on the consumer, but on the, uh, um, the business side? Yeah. So the, cons- on the business side of the house. So the business, the business part, it's like most things in life. I think business drives innovation. There's, there's good money to be made in the business side of uh, telematics because mm-hmm. we have to drive ourselves pretty hard to develop product that's robust and mm-hmm. works. And, com- and companies quite frankly are prepared to pay because they generate a very good return on the investment. So they may generate, in fact, sometimes five or 10 times the return on their monthly fee that we would charge um, for the service. So while we're doing that, and the businesses are paying for the maturity of this technology, the consumers are getting the benefit of all this intellectual property we've built up over time. And now we're gonna see this technology incorporated into, actually in some cases, the accelerometer work that we did on the device is now being used in the iPhones you were just talking about, mobile phones that all have these accelerometers baked into them. Well, we don't need to run our tool in a integrated device, into the device connected to the vehicle. Um, We've learned how to do this in software. It's firmware actually that calibrates the accelerometer and our software, which is really firmware, can be run just as easily on a mobile device as it can in a connected car. So I think that the, that the consumer market will likely go down these really powerful, as you were just saying in your last last interview, um, into the smartphone marketplace. These smartphones are incredibly powerful tools, and we can use the accelerometer and the GPS in the smartphone to perform a telematics type of a solution. We just can't connect it to the vehicle itself to get your fuel economy performance. Right. Um, uh, you're right, because the, the, they are very accurate. I mean, I'll, I'll watch if I'm using uh, the uh, GPS on the, on the smartphone. It, it like, knows to the, how fast or how uh, right down to the mile, you know, how fast I'm driving. And, and you, know, you would think it was attached to the uh, speedometer, but it's not. You know, it, it just knows. It, it, it's, it's extremely accurate. It's amazing. To, 
yeah. amazing technology. So they did this. There was this uh, leap of technology that happened. I think it had to do with making the devices smaller for the smartphone re revolution. But there's something called correlators that enables a GPS to locate itself. Mm -hmm. And if you can imagine your smartphone that you might have had seven years ago, you turn, or even if you had it back in the old days, like Garmin or TomTom, you have a Garmin you bought, and you power it on, and you put it right beside you in the passenger seat, and you wait for it to get a GPS latch. Mm -hmm. And you wait, and you wait, and it's going to be you're going to be waiting forever. You're going to want to put that thing right up under the dashboard. They give you a little mounting suction cup uh -huh. thing. Uh -huh. You put it under the glass windshield. Finally, it has line of sight of the sky, and bang, you're going to get your GPS. You don't do that with your cell phone today. You turn your cell phone on, you put it down beside you in the passenger seat, and it gets a GPS latch. There's 1 million correlators now. There used to be 12 or 16. You can imagine the, the multiplies. There were 16 different ways about six, seven years ago where they would correlate and try to figure out what is the GPS position of this device. Now there's one million correlators. You can put your smartphone, turn it on, probably put it at your feet inside your car, and it's still going to get a GPS acquisition because of all these correlators that are able to get an accurate pinpoint location. So GPS technology is phenomenal how it's advanced in recent years. The other advancement, of course, is power consumption. So you've got the GPS in your phone or in our device, and it was the most power sucking sensor <laughs> yeah. that we would have on, on a phone and you would know that from years ago you turn the gps on your phone for navigation three hours later your phone is dead it's killed the battery right. now you can turn on maps in your smartphone and it doesn't kill the battery after a day of using it, it uses a lot of battery power but not as much as it used to so they've really made what do you these turn sensors on? very sophisticated what is it you turn on on the smartphone naps your, your, yeah, your Google Maps or oh, your maps, navigation maps. tool. Okay, yeah, using. exactly, right. Uh, right yeah, your maps, right? Yeah, navigation. You right. want to be able to turn left, turn right, navigate. Uh, that is the most power-consuming thing you've got when you turn on the GPS in your smartphone. But you, and yet it doesn't pull the battery power down like it used to. Yeah, you know, the other thing is that, that uh, I mean, I was speaking as one who has both a TomTom -tom and, and, and an iPhone, I've been uh, I, I, there have been times where I've been tempted just to get rid of the TomTom -tom because... Uh, uh, although it's convenient, you can buy a, a, a dash mount now for your smartphone, and uh, and 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 when you put it into the dash mount, it, 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 that also is plugged to the cigarette lighter, so your phone is still getting you know uh, power. So you're really not even draining it that much at all. If anything, you're charging it while it's in your car, and they can do pretty much everything that the uh, the other navigation device could do. Uh, step by step, right, and your maps are being updated. Yeah, and your maps are up to date on your on your iPhone. They're not up to date on your old traditional devices. So yeah. you can imagine how all of this technology with GPS and navigation and maps has affected the the uh, business development or the research development lines over at TomTom Tom and Garmin. I'm sure that they're, well, they have adjusted their, their roadmaps, right? They have to go and adapt to a smartphone revolution. Yeah, they do. Uh, you have to adapt or s to survive. Otherwise, yeah, you just can't. Um, well, it's not that bad. <laughs> exactly. Uh, our music is being brought to you by my co-host. Uh, Thank you. I tried. <laughs> so, Thanks, Ben. We appreciate it. <laughs> so, um, okay. So, so, uh, but again, the, the device that you sell at Geotab primarily is uh, for uh, the businesses uh, that are concerned with things like, I mean, are, what are some of the typical businesses that use it? I mean, are we talking like FedEx and UPS and the U.S. Postal Service? I mean, the big delivery companies, or uh, are we talking something smaller than those? Yeah, so you're right. So we, we do have one of the largest delivery companies using our technology, uh, PepsiCo and Frito-Lay, also a fully deployed our technology. Wow. Uh, and then you'll even have a fleet like the Orkin Man, you know, the mm, pest control company. Sure. Um, and, and all the way down through auto parts distributors to, um, you know, a local company that might be having a three or four food trucks. So you've got literally, you know, very, very small fleets, individual pharmaceutical companies, pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical sales through mm -hmm, yeah. pickup trucks, mm -hmm. all the way up through some of the biggest brands you can imagine. And these companies, especially the large ones, they are literally running their business based on the data that our technology is delivering. They know the time of the morning when the vehicle leaves the depot. They know how much driving time that vehicle has when they serve a client, how much time they spend at a customer. They look at the ratio between driving time and customer service time. They want to maximize customer service time, obviously, and reduce driving time um, because that's when we're making money, when we're delivering products to customers. We're not making money when we're driving. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
And on the and then when we're doing that, when we're behind the windshield, we are driving. We need to make sure that our drivers are safe, so they're not speeding, they're not rapidly accelerating or falling too close. So this the whole story of telematics is really about trying to make sure in the business world, trying to make sure that that when we have vehicles that are on the road and we have our own employees, which are most companies' most precious possession or their own people, that they are efficient, that they're leaving when they should be leaving, that they're safe behind the wheel. When they are behind the wheel, they're spending the right amount of time at the customer, and, um, and then they get back at the end of the day, and that the vehicle itself is predictable, meaning it's not going to break down roadside. So we are looking for fault codes and maintenance codes that allow us to schedule a vehicle in for maintenance so we can plan all the maintenance we have to do. We it's- don't want to have any unplanned maintenance or roadside failures because that's a safety concern and obviously a loss of productivity. Too. It, is this all done in real time? I mean, if a, if a driver and, a, and one of the vehicles is you know uh, is going faster than the speed limit, you can literally uh, see that and make a phone call to the driver's cell phone and say, hey, you know, you need to slow down. I mean, I mean, can you, uh, how close to real time are you with this? Yeah, so um, we would never want to phone a driver while he's driving because that would be distracted driving the vehicle. <laughs> but we did launch, thanks for, thanks for the entry. You didn't know it, but you just <laughs> allowed me to launch our GoTalk product, which we just recently launched. GoTalk is an add-on speaker mm-hmm. that's mounted in the vehicle, and it's text-to-speech. So if we find that Ben is traveling at 10 miles an hour over the posted speed limit, uh. we process that data in real time against the rules engine and the, on the server side in the cloud. Mm-hmm. If we detect that Ben just broke the speed rule, we can send an instruction back to the vehicle and it will instruct Ben through spoken words, Ben, you need to slow down. And you can literally do free form text. You can type in exactly what the message is that you want Ben to respond to and the entire transaction can take less than two seconds. See, Ben would think that's pretty that, amazing. Considering that we're processing 600 million pieces of data a day, yeah. that's pretty amazing that we can move that amount of data in a day and process <laughs> every single one of those pieces of data against the rules engine for various events that might occur, like overspeeding, mm-hmm. and communicate back to make Ben more safe behind the wheel. Wow. Oh, so, oh, so, so, so it's kind of like a can, like, you know, if, if these circumstances are met, then you can have this preset message relayed. Yeah. Okay. You don't have to have That's someone exactly monitor, right you don't have yeah. to have a person monitoring it right. automatically. No, <laughs> don't, dude, you, we don't. So people monitoring things are not scalable for businesses today, right? So for, in the technology world, you want to make things that are, robust, that work very, very well, that allow the customer the capability to create rules or events to go and manage their business by. And they can do that through our software user interface. They can configure the software any way they want. Um, once they save those rules, the data that comes into their database will be processed against, processed against those rules. And then obviously the system will take action. It could, as I say, interact with the driver through audible feedback to the driver to coach him to be a safer driver behind the wheel, but at the same time, it can also, you know, send a distress a distress call. If there's an accident that's just been detected in the vehicle, we can actually send a web service call or an alert to a supervisor. Um, in some cases, in the oil and gas industry, it's called lone worker. You want to send off a distress call to a dispatch center and have them go and uh, take some response to assist the driver in need. Um, so that's all. It's all really good use of the technology. What about other things like I realize you're in the uh, was it the O the, what was the connector that you mentioned the uh, uh, on the uh, OBD OBD thank you the OBD two port uh, which uh, uh, th- that's actually monitoring uh, vehicle uh, activity uh, all the different things that you can monitor and make sure that uh, for maintenance purposes and I guess speed as well uh, all that information is, comes through that how much do you rely on the OBD2 as opposed to the other technology that's built into the uh, the uh, geotab hardware itself uh, I mean uh, if what if you get some can, can you get conflicting information like the uh, the OBD2 will say the car is moving at you know 40 miles an hour but your your box says that the car is moving at 50 miles an hour or or they kind of work together uh, so no, that's a good question. So um, GPS, for example, um, does produce speed. So a GPS sensor, if you didn't have speed coming from the vehicle, mm-hmm. you can get speed from GPS. So GPS is an amazing thing. It's mm-hmm. not just latitude and longitude, right? Or day and time. It also produces speed. Mm-hmm. 
And if it connect to the vehicle's engine bus, there's something called a vehicle speed sensor mm -hmm. that the vehicle speed sensor is going to play that back out to me. If we detect that there's a vehicle speed sensor um, that I'm reading information from, I'm going to rely on that. It's, it's a more reliable, more trustworthy source of information. If there is no vehicle speed sensor data, then I'm going to rely on the GPS for speed. What vehicle doesn't have speed information? I mean, the, 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 the speedometer is everything all attached. Isn't that like the... Well, see, I have this fleet of 1964 Volkswagen Beetles that I need to send out daily. Right. Yeah. But OBD, OBD was invented in 1996, and, and vehicle speed sensor wasn't part of the original OBD2 law. So mm -hmm. I can connect to the OBD2 port, but for older model vehicles, I'm not going to get vehicle speed sensor data. Mm, exactly. Um, and, and, and so the other things you can mention, you, you mentioned is obviously location. Can you kind of like geofence a, a, a particular vehicle, and if it goes beyond a certain region, it's going to let you know? I mean, can you... Uh, is that something that's necessary with the technology that you offer? I, we definitely have, it's, it's exactly right. It's called zoning or geofencing. Uh -huh. um, yeah, clients do that a lot. And there's for di different reasons. Um, in some cases, if you're a state or a municipality, you're going to want to create a perimeter around your entire municipality. And you're going to want to know whether your city vehicles are being used outside of your boundary line. So there's good reasons to do that. Mm. From a practical point of view, there's this law in the United States for trucking called IFTA. It's a fuel tax law that basically says that vehicles that fuel up in one state and you pay state tax mm -hmm. to fuel up, let's say, in Washington state, you cross the border into Oregon. Well, you need to go and account for all of the miles that you drove in Washington state and all of the miles that you drive in Oregon. Even though you fueled up in Washington State and you paid that state's tax, which might be a high jurisdiction tax, you're spending your time driving in Oregon, which might have a lower tax rate. Wow. You get to offset the tax you paid by paying in a high jurisdiction, even though you spent time driving in a low jurisdiction. Yeah. I need to know the geofence sure. in every state, yeah. and all of your activity in every state, and we have and to audit makes, that. And, and it makes a lot of sense. Listen, uh, we're, uh, we're at uh, uh, Colin, we're at the... Uh, bottom of the hour break, so we're going to take a short break and then come back to, and continue on. You listen to the Computer America Show. Please stay with us. Hi, this is Craig Crossman, host of the Computer America Show. You have important meetings to schedule. Your company's getting ready for its IPO, and you're in charge of the PTA fundraiser this month. So how do you coordinate everyone to be available at the same time? Are you still using emails, phone calls, even text messages to schedule meetings with a group of people? How's that working out for you? Not so great, huh? It's a fact that every day, millions of people suffer from scheduling headaches. Well, with Doodle, scheduling meetings with a group of people is quick and easy. With Doodle, you can easily propose available times to each member. Each one checks off the times that they are available, and then you simply pick the time that works best for the group, all in an easy-to-read display that integrates with your existing calendar. Nothing could be more simple. Give Doodle a try for free, and like millions of Doodle users, you'll truly see how easy it is to find the perfect date and time for all your meetings. That's www.doodle.com. Looking for a best friend? Brother Wolf Animal Rescue has your best friend waiting just for you. The mission of Brother Wolf Animal Rescue is to help build a sustainable, no-kill community where no dogs or cats are ever killed for population control. Where true euthanasia is reserved only for animals who are irremediably suffering or for animals who are truly a threat to society and with no hope of rehabilitation. Brother Wolf staff and volunteers go door to door, neighborhood by neighborhood, to educate citizens about local resources available for at risk pets and to help their families connect with those resources. Brother Wolf's community based approach to no kill helps keep family pets healthy happy and in their homes and out of the local shelter system in the first place. For more information or to make a tax-deductible donation to this wonderful 501c3 organization, visit their website at www.bwar.org. Help to realize Brother Wolf's vision when no animal is euthanized for lack of a home. Who's a good boy? <laughs> Yeah, Cleveland's where sports teams don't win pennants, they do pennants. Hi, I'm Marty Winston with the News Tips Bulletin Review for Computer America, this time LifeProof Cases. LifeProof is an OtterBox brand for phone cases 
that somehow manage to deliver the level of protection you'd expect from them, but in a much lighter form factor. We tested on an iPhone 6. These cases are wonderfully thin and the charging slot is easy to open. But removing the case from the handset is challenging. That is something you don't do very often. One nice touch, pun intended, you can use the fingerprint reader through the cover. So bottom line, life-proof cases are drop-proof, waterproof, slender defenders. Marty Winston with a News Tips Bulletin Review for Computer America. Welcome back to the Computer America Show. Finally, thank you, Marty Winston, for taking a shot at Cleveland. They That, that place <laughs> needed to be taken down a peg. Uh, but yeah, that was the last time that you'll be hearing that particular News Tips Bulletin Review because we will have two brand new ones, indeed, next week. All right. Um, and yeah, you know, they're always a lot of fun to listen to. So, uh, but before we get back to Mr. Colin, uh, we have a prize to give away that we do every week and we give it away on Friday and it's about that time. So, uh, Greg, yes, take it away. All right. Uh, well, this, we have, uh, the social media winner of the week, uh, and that prize goes to Patricia Hilke. <laughs> Patricia, congratulations. Uh, you're the social media winner of the week. Uh, she wins the Logitech MX Anywhere 2 wireless mouse with its uh, dark field technology. Uh, it works on glass surfaces, shiny surfaces. It'll pair up the three computers and switch between them with the touch of a button thanks to its easy switch technology. Basically, and I said it's $80, $79.99 mouse. Uh, Patricia listens to Computer America in Hellendale. California. I knew Hallandale, but I never knew there was a Hallandale. I think Hallandale's in Florida, and Hallandale yes. is in California, because I know I looked it up. So, <laughs> uh, anyway, Patricia, congratulations. You're our winner, our, our social media winner this week. And don't forget to go to ComputerAmerica.com and get registered for the next one. We do it every single Friday. Uh, who knows? We could call, be calling your name. Just go to the uh, social media contests page at ComputerAmerica.com and, and uh, just just follow all the social media that we uh, that we are involved with, and each one counts for an entry. And uh, that's how you enter. It's real simple. Okay, so uh, that's our winner, and uh, we're Ben. We're continuing to uh, talk to our uh, our guest, um, who is uh, Colin Sutherland, who is the uh, GeoTab is Vice President of Global Sales and Marketing, and. Uh, we were just getting to the point of all the different things that you can do with this. Um, um, are there uh, a few best practices GeoTab can share with us uh, that uh, in this situation that you can let us, our listeners know? I mean, yeah. So, from a if you're a small business person mm -hmm. right now. Uh, and you've been watching what's going on in the stock market and the barrel of oil is low. Um, you're probably, you know, reviewing your operating budget. I would imagine in 2016, you're mm -hmm. thinking all the assumptions that I had going into 2016. I'm going to recheck my my thinking. Am I going to have as robust a year in 2016 as I thought I was going to have? And the first thing is, then you need to be using this technology to measure exactly what your savings are. So best mm -hmm. practices would first be to measure um, your driving time. What assets have you got and how are they actually being used? Uh, the reason you want to do that is there's actually a bit of a trend going on in uh, fleets, which is going from what we call fleet management or vehicle management to mobility management. So the new trend is actually going through Europe a little bit right now. I think we're going to see it come over here within the next three to four years is give the employee the capability to do their job, but through a choice of mobility options, which might include Uber, it might include the taxi industry, it might mm -hmm. include public transit, and it might include a car. Um, so that's really interesting. So if you are thinking about that as a business owner, you might think, why do I have company cars? Do I have to provide my employees with cars or do I pay them a car allowance? What is my policy there? How can I go and best manage my costs around mm -hmm. assets, whether it's my own company cars or whether it's not? Well, the first thing you need to know is how are they being driven? How many miles do my vehicles actually put on in a day? Are they parked in my employees? If they're a salesperson, are they parked 
at the person's home two and a half days every week and they're only being using, used periodically to go out to the field or not. So uh, absolute best practice is first, measure. You've got to measure. You can't manage anything until you start measuring. And we want to measure mm. what is happening in a 24-hour day, seven days a week. Right. When do vehicles leave? When do they come back? Are they being used throughout the day? And then while we're measuring the time of these vehicles, so how they're being driven and where they're being driven, um, we want to make sure that they're being driven safely. And you're going to look at things like idle time, which is a risk. You don't want to leave a vehicle idling, especially mm-hmm. when it's cold. Right. People will turn the engine on and they'll walk away because that vehicle is going to be stolen someday. So we want to make sure that there's no idling going on. We want to make sure that the vehicle is being driven safely behind the wheel. And then now, you know, the new thing today, it's because fuel cost is so low. It's really half of what it was just a couple of years ago. Um, a lot of businesses, especially people that are really into the environment, are looking at carbon footprint. So even though fuel is still half the price, it's still the same diesel or gasoline that we're putting into our vehicles, we want to manage carbon. We want to really be careful about greenhouse gas emissions. That was all part of the Paris Accord back in November. Um, in Europe, sure. they take carbon very seriously. They actually tax carbon for fleets and for personal cars. You get taxed based on the car you choose. There's actually a carbon tax on that car. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that we're seeing a lot of companies here take a look at what is the CO2 emissions of my vehicle and how can I go and reduce CO2. So those are really best practices. Just measure, measure, measure. Sure. Once you measure stuff, the whole world, quite frankly, it's funny, the whole world opens up for you. Right. Once you know what's going on, then you can start making informed decisions about, oh, now I know more about my vehicles. Now I know more about my time right. and what customers I'm spending time with. And now you can make some really critical path decisions around right. um, acquisition of vehicles and employees. And it's, that's why those companies I mentioned earlier they rely on this technology to make their decisions for them because it's all measurement based. Right. They rely on it. They can't. They couldn't conduct the business that they're doing unless they had this type of data um, feeding them with uh, with information. Yeah, sure. And uh, so they would make uh, they'll finally conclude whether it pays for itself. With the, uh, your own having your own fleet or using uh, employees' uh, cars uh, certainly makes it. You have to start somewhere, and certainly this is a great way to do it. Talk a little bit about your competition. Uh, uh, I assume there are competitors out there, and, and what are Geotab's main differentiators from from your competitors? Yeah, so uh, in the in the telematics space, a few if your listeners were actually into the fleet space, uh, and or they had called on a business, um, that business owner or fleet owner probably has already received two or three phone calls this week from some companies trying to sell them telematics technology. Mm-hmm. And there's at least two or 300 companies wow. trying to sell this technology to small businesses. Yeah, it's, they're everywhere. Because in that, as I said, in the market's growing. The, the entire market is growing. There's only 7 million vehicles that have this technology installed and there's 21 million vehicles that are considered to be commercial vehicles um, mm-hmm. that could use it. So there's still 14 million vehicles that are uh, in our industry, we call them greenfield, meaning they, they need to have something installed in them. Right. So that's why this industry is growing so fast. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of competitors. The difference is that we connect to that vehicle bus that I talked about. Most of the people in this industry still only rely on GPS, and they haven't quite figured out how to use that accelerometer um, for aggressive driving. Uh, they haven't figured that one out yet. It's a tricky little sensor to get right, and they haven't figured it out. Uh, and they also haven't figured out engine diagnostics data, so, you know, while the vast majority of uh, the industry still is your earliest comment, I think Craig was, hey, can I see the vehicle on a map? That's how the vehicle was born, and the vast majority of the competitors still are looking at, can I see a vehicle on a map? Um, we've really moved our, our bar forward and have focused on the uh, acquisition of all this other really awesome data, and uh, it has distinguished us. So, Right now, we're considered to be the, the fastest growing telematics company in the world. Uh, we're very fortunate to be in that position, um, having sold, sold over 200,000 devices in the last 12 months. And we expect to, um, I said, you know, double that number uh, over the next couple of years. No, it, when, uh, we're doing really ex- exceptionally well when in you growing s- our space. When you sell this, uh, the, 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 the device, uh, you all... There's three. You have the software. You have the hardware. You sell the device. You have the software. And is there is there a monitoring fee of some sort? Uh, and how does that work? Yeah, that is typically how it's sold. You're right, Craig. So you would sell the device, and it would come with a monthly fee. Mm-hmm. And then that monthly fee would include the software user interface and access to the data and the reports and everything else. And and quite frankly, from a business point of view, 
As I said, vast majority of companies are returning that monthly fee investment. Um, they're returning that at least four or five fold. Um, sometimes it's 10 times wow. um, on a monthly basis. We often will say that once you install the technology, it has paid for itself on the third or fourth or fifth day of every single month. And that's why it's so affordable and why so many companies are using it now. Yeah, just uh, just off the top, uh, are there variable sliding scales? But uh, I mean, or, or is there just a flat rate? Can I what this costs so our listeners would know? Also, usually for uh, a solution where you're getting all of those benefits I talked about, the engine diagnostics and the safety benefits and mm -hmm. the GPS and everything else, you're something less than $30 a month. Okay. Wow. Uh, uh, and of course, if you have, uh, of course, if you have uh, a fleet of a of a fifth of a hundred trucks, then, then then it's appropriate. But it certainly makes a lot of sense. Or do you have a do you have a um, uh, uh, a group rate of some sort? <laughs> if you buy, if you do Groupon, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Yeah. No. So you know, we have a couple of different plans for for some businesses. It's um based on their consumption of the data. So some people aren't ready to consume the safety data or the engine diagnostics data, mm -hmm. and they can subscribe to a solution that only includes the GPS oh, or only includes okay. GPS and safety. And that enables them to get to a, a lower number. We really don't want people paying for reports and data that they're frankly not ready to consume yet. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have a, a back office solution that allows them to upgrade when they're ready to go and change their consumption of the data to maybe include engine diagnostics. They can simply um, check a box and then they get upgraded to the um, that's nice to more data and more yeah. reports I mean yeah it's you, great yeah you sound more like you know it was at the like the satellite services you know what's how many stations do you want I don't need all 350 stations I just need you know the sports I don't want the sports channels you know, that, there you like, go right there you know exactly so right you, there. you exactly can right. you can selectively uh, pick which uh, uh, features that you want uh, in terms of growth you you met you keep mentioning this what what, what is geotab's goal for the 2016. So uh, right now we're sitting at around uh, 500,000 vehicles that we're currently monitoring uh, or tracking with our technology. Mm -hmm. uh, by the end of 2017, we we have a target to be at 1 million. So we want to double our current um, base of active vehicles um, within the next two years. Uh, by the end of this year, we think we're going to just be over 700,000. And then in 2017, we'll get to the uh, over the 1 million mark. So it's fairly ambitious goals, um, but certainly, as we say, the industry is growing dramatically, and our technology is being um, sold by channel partners. So um, in going to market, we don't sell direct to end customers. And I'm not sure whether you've ever had that experience in some of the other interviews you've talked to um, in the technology sector, but our experience has been that you can't be world-class research and development and manufacturing and uh, spending money in um, moving the technology forward and being world class in it, and also be world class in sales. I, I just don't think you can. I think it was Microsoft in the early early days um, decided that right. They had Microsoft certified partners that took the products to market, um, but they knew who they were and they still know who they are at Microsoft. And we felt that. In fact, our earliest days, we said, you know, we're going to build our channel distribution strategy around that Microsoft model. It makes a lot of sense to us. So we developed that, and as a result now, we have about 120 really amazing channel partners that include wireless carriers, um, some of the largest fleet management partners in the industry, and some independent um, companies that are, frankly, located throughout the world uh, that sell our technology and represent it to their customers on a local basis. And, um, and those are the people that are, are facing the end client. They're the the eyes and ears and, uh, of our technology. They're listening to the client's needs and they adapt our technology uh, for what the client needs it to do. So um, it's kind of a, I don't know what I'd be interested, Craig, Ben, if you've had an experience with that with other technology firms, but that's been our success story, mm -hmm. I think, is being laser focused on what our role is in delivering technology to an end customer through channel. And it has been exceptionally successful um, for us as our it, to, I think for us to be able to maintain a leadership position in, the, in this uh, telematic space. What, what about, uh, so you said for expansion, in other words, uh, you're, you have the backbone, you have the infrastructure to expand, like double as your capacity, uh, hardware-wise or server-wise or whatever it is that you're using, you're all set for that or, or can't expand to it? Yeah, I mean, it's an awesome question, right? So those are the three 
In the IT sector, those are the three things you've got to worry about. Scalability, reliability, and security. Those mm-hmm. are the three things that we have stenciled in our, our foreheads when we come into work. So is our solution reliable? Is it scalable? And is it secure? And uh, that's more, more than innovation. Those are the most important three things that we have to deliver to our customers. So on the scalability side, you're absolutely right. It's going to be horizontally scalable through a federation of servers. We've mm-hmm. got to be able to do that. Um, not only are we able to go and scale up the hosting of the data in the cloud, um, 600 million pieces of data a day, and that's obviously going to double as we grow our base of customers. We're going to get to 1 billion pieces of data every day um, that we're going to have to process daily. And that's a big task, and we've got just an exceptional team of Mm -hmm. engineers here that are focused on supporting that infrastructure. But not just that, you also have to create the admin infrastructure to be able to invoice for it on an accurate, timely basis. You've got to take all the bottlenecks and the manual processes out of the business in order to make sure that you really are truly scalable throughout an organization, which also includes the financial, the admin group of the company, right? just as much as it does the IT sector. And we've had that because we've grown from a very small group of people and then incrementally grown the business year over year over year for 15, 16 years now, 20 years. Um, it's, we've been able to do that because our very first uh, philosophy in business was let's make sure that we eliminate all manual processes. Let's make sure, let's make sure we build scalable processes in every aspect of the business, not just the software aspect. Colin, uh, talk to us a little bit of what, uh, about what you see. Uh, for the future of telematics in general, not only just for for uh, uh, geotab, but for telematics completely. Yeah, so I just left this IoT conference, and I'm sure that you have talked about the Internet of Things on your <laughs> program in the past. Sure. Right? I mean, I, I, there was an Internet of Things conference that was recently held in Fort Lauderdale this week, and I was speaking at that conference. And, you know, the 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 future of telematics really is moving data. It's not going to be so much about how important is the device and the uh, that we collect the di- device or the, the information from vehicles and we move it. It's all the data that we're accumulating, these 600 million pieces of data. And then how is that data going to be stored in the cloud? And then what other useful pieces of information can we get from other secure cloud services like weather data, like accident collision data, like risky intersection data? And then how can I combine all of that information together to make more, uh, I guess, more useful product for our customers, ultimately consumers? This technology will ultimately become um, consumer friendly. Uh, When we get to smart cities and smart grid and vehicles are autonomous and driving down the road by themselves in 10 years time, um, communicating to uh, some infrastructure, uh, it's the data that those vehicles are communicating um, to the infrastructure, into a cloud environment that we'll be part of to be able to share our knowledge of data processing and what all that information means. And that really is the future of this business. So we're still fledgling. We see such a huge upside for telematics. Um, you know, we do, this industry was just born in 1996. That was the really the birthday of telematics. Mm-hmm. And we've been involved in it uh, since the beginning. Um, from our early, early days of telematics. And I still feel like we're going through these revolutions where we're talking about the collection of the data. So we have the, dis- the, the data collection revolution and we had the cellular wireless. It's got to be all about recurring revenue and subscription, making it accessible. But we're entering into the next phase, which is the big data revolution on and the Internet of Things, being able to combine multiple pieces of data. And our contribution will be um, how we know how to process vehicle related data. And uh, I think it's incredibly exciting. We've got at least a decade or 15 years ahead of us to um, be very, very busy. And we're excited about that. So um, any of your listeners that are obviously interested in um, internet of things and transportation and mm-hmm. smart city or infrastructure, sure. uh, you know, they can certainly just ping me on LinkedIn or, uh, or shoot me an email yeah, I'd be happy to go and, and guide them, provide some some guidance if I can um, to help move them along because it's really through uh, many, many companies also focus in the same areas of, uh, of acquiring data and making it useful for uh, for businesses initially or for the consumer. That's really, that's really what we want to partner with. We've got this thing called the marketplace that we launched. We see that as really important for the next five years, which is a software development kit that we publish, which is free. 
and it enables software developers to create applications based on data sets from GPS, accelerometer, engine diagnostics. You can create these third-party applications and we give them a home. It's called the Geotab Marketplace. They can put it up on the web and they can go and start marketing their own technology, their own software solutions that businesses may want to buy. Um, we've got obviously thousands and thousands of vehicles connected and that marketplace is exposed to all of our customers. So um, great opportunity for even your listeners who might be in the software development business um, who are interested in what we've been talking about for the last hour right. to get involved in telematics simply by going to our software development kit, right. and uh, which is just sdk.geotab.com. They can just go to the website, take a look for it for themselves, look at it for themselves, sample code, well-documented, development videos so they can see our developers talking about the code that they wrote, and they can get involved. Okay. Uh, and again, the website is www.geotab, G-E-O-T-A-B.com, or you can just head over to computeramerica.com. We have a link right on our homepage to the Geotab website, uh, and uh, you can uh, check that out for yourself. Uh, Colin Sutherland. Uh, by the way, my wife's maiden name is Sutherland. Just thought you liked it. Oh, fantastic. So she's from the north of Scotland. <laughs> yes, she is. <laughs> exactly. Um, is she a redhead like me? Yes, yeah, she is a redhead, as a matter of fact. Yeah, mm -hmm. she is. There you go. There it is. There you go. Uh, so anyway, uh, I want to hire your wife. For you. I, I will say hi to her for you. For you. Absolutely. She's a clan. She's a clan person, so she's, a, she's part of the clan. There's she's in the good book. There it is. Exactly. Uh, listen, Colin, I, I want to thank you so much uh, for being here with us, letting our uh, listeners know about the uh, the uh, telematics industry. It was very interesting. It's very interesting. Exactly. Yeah. And again, and of course, uh, you can listen to it. If you missed a portion, part of the, the uh, of the interview, you can certainly go to computermarket.com and uh, the audio and video is there as well. So you can uh, check it out for yourself. Thank you so much for being with us here uh, today, Colin. I uh, hope you have a really nice weekend. And, uh, and thanks again for being on Computer America. Hey, Craig, Ben, and your listeners, thank you very much for your interest. Really do appreciate it. All right. You take care. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. There you, you go. Bye-bye. All right, there you go. All right, uh, again, Geotab, check it out for yourself. And uh, uh, I, you know, I, you know, I have been uh, thinking about. You know, I have a TomTom -tom right now in in my car, and I've had it for a number. I think this is a little overkill if you want to replace your TomTom. -tom. Yeah, I know, but I, I've been thinking about retiring the TomTom. -tom. I pay I pay like sixty bucks a year and everything, and now they're phasing out one of the major components for it. Uh, which is the uh, the cellular component? Evidently, the type of cellular they're using is 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 old, and even this is the latest version. They don't even know what they're going to be doing. And I'm thinking just retiring it and just using my smartphone. Uh, I get a get a one of those uh, windshield clamps, you know, that you can put it up on the windshield and uh, and plug it into the cigarette lighter and just use it as my navigation device. Well, the benefit of of having the dedicated TomTom -tom or or Magellan or you know uh -huh. whichever na navigation device was. Having again that dedicated device to free up your phone so that your phone could be other be other places do other things, mm -hmm. but I guess you know smartphones have gotten pretty good at multitasking. You can talk on a phone, you yeah. can voice text on a phone, you can sure. uh, you know do you know, browse music on your phone while you're also navigating without you know killing your battery completely. Right. It's uh it's, it's gotten to a pretty good place. Yeah, and and it, it, we mentioned the killing the battery, but as I mentioned some of the the uh, uh windshield mounts now allow you to plug it, your phone into the uh cigarette lighter so you're not draining the battery at all. As a matter of fact, you're charging it when it's in your car. So I think that was probably the last remaining bastion of, of why you'd want to ha not use your smartphone. But as you said, uh, you can get phone calls. You, it can navigate street by street by voice. Uh, it does everything that the the navigator does. It's got points of interest. Um, I'm thinking of basically. I think we're just going to retire it uh, next year, uh, unless they come up with something different. I think that uh, I'm just going to because my smartphone is always with me, and I'm in the car. You know, I use it. When I take it out. I take it with me. Um, uh, it's I, I, a sign I of the times. It's a sign of. The, I mean, can no, you? no, no offense. I mean, uh, you know, Tom Tom and Garmin have been, you know, been on the show many, many times. Yeah. It's just, you know, technology get, uh, is getting better. Yeah. Unless I'm missing some subtle point, which I'm not. I don't think I can. I mean, I can do favorites. I can do everything that I can do on the Tom Tom. I can do on on the uh, maps portion of the, of the uh, of the smartphone. Um, it really. Uh, and you, I even have a choice. You know, TomTom Tom even makes an app for the smartphone, but the, why bother? I mean, because I can do everything with that. Uh, well, uh, the, thing, the thing that you're buying or uh, buying, subscribing to, getting are the maps, mm -hmm. 
which, uh, you know, despite Apple's initial launch, has has definitely gotten better. Oh my and god! And I guess you're you're getting some other of the software features, which I think at this point are pretty ubiquitous throughout the industry. They are. They are. Yeah. I, I think it's time to phase it out. Uh, I, don't, I really don't see much of a use for it anymore. Especially, I'll, I'll just get a, a nice uh, clamp, you know, again for the windshield, which they make. And uh, just put the phone in there when I get in the car. You let it go quietly with dignity, huh? You had, you had to tell the whole country that. Yeah, you, had, that you had to tell the whole world on your show. It's <laughs> going away. It's probably going to go away. Uh, uh, well, listen, we're, we're about out of time. Again, uh, I want to uh, congratulate our social media winner of the week, uh, Patricia Hilke uh, from Hellendale, California. Gets the Logitech MX Anywhere 2 wireless mouse. Valued at $80. Congratulations to her. And uh, I want to thank uh, our our first hour guest for Matter and Form, uh, Drew Cox, uh, talking about the uh, the bevel uh, for three D printing, and of course uh, our our guest for this hour, uh, Colin Sutherland from GeoTab. What do we got coming up uh, for the week ahead? Uh, uh, the first hour, ninety second. We're going to have a company called Deal Moon on the show and, and they are an online shopping site but you know there are a lot of online shopping sites but they are doing some pretty unique things uh that we felt we would invite them on the show to talk about and uh we'll get into that on monday and then in the second hour we're going to have a company called chat light <laughs> this is very clever the idea here is that um, no batteries are needed it fits everything it's a long lasting light so when you're chatting with someone, 60 seconds, you just look better when they see on a video chat. You look better, and it's called the chat light. Uh, we're going to have them on the uh, program as well. As I said, that about wraps it up. Thank you all so much for being with us here, and uh, I hope all of you have a wonderful weekend. Hey, catch a good movie, you know? A lot of good movies coming out. It's, it's time to hit the movie uh, lines again. You, you, you didn't name a movie, though. Uh, Batman versus Superman. That that's not out yet. In March, <laughs> really two months away. Wow. <laughs> anyway, have a great weekend, and Ben and I will see you here on Monday afternoon. So until Monday afternoon, this is Craig Crossman, hoping that your hard disk never becomes floppy. We'll see you on Monday. Have, have a good one, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you for using Blog Talk Radio. Goodbye. Okay, again, everybody watching us on our Google Hangouts or our after show, thanks so much for being here and have a great weekend, and we'll see you on Monday. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.